Hey everybody, today Rado talks through episode 17, which is going to be 100% devoted to the Essen Spiel Convention uh, for 2016. So episode 17, Spiel 2016. Right. Whew, this is going to be a long one, folks. Get comfortable. I have spent the last 48 hours digging through uh, Eric Martin's excellent... Essen 2016 preview geek list. It's on Board Game Geek. He does this every year. Um, you know, he does all of our work for us. Although, man, even still, like I said, there are so many games on there. It took me forever. What do I got? What am I going to be talking about today? Well, for starters, I'm going to talk about 45 games that range from must have, will not leave without, all the way down to, well, that sounds really pretty cool. I really got to find out more about that game. So that's what we're going to start with. We're going to go through the 45 games of interest that I have identified as I really am going to try and seek out. And actually, it's interesting, that list is going to serve double duty. One, it's just for anybody who's going to the show and you're curious what I'm interested in, but also for all my Rotto Runs Through backers who get to vote, they, uh, well, actually, the high-level voters are going to be voting on what games I'm going to pick up. And so this list will hopefully help them uh, make more informed decisions, because some of these games they probably will have never heard of. So I'm going to do my best to try and sell what's cool about them so the voters can make informed decisions, because they're going to decide what games I actually go and get. And uh, so that's the, be the, probably the first half of this is going to be talking about those 45 games. But that won't be all. After that, I will then also talk about how many is it. It looks like 18 expansions, which again, the voters are going to be choosing how many of these expansions am I going to be picking up and seeking out and ultimately doing run-throughs of. So first we'll talk about the games, then the, the must-has games, then we'll talk about the must-has expansions. After that, we will move on to a list of what is it now? Uh, 36 games that I've already done run-throughs for. So, um, you know, it's, I mean, I, and some of these games are absolutely phenomenal. Some of these games are potential Game of the Year candidates, and some of them are like, oh, well, that was kind of nice. But the important thing is, I'm not going to spend too much time on them, because you can just go and watch my run-throughs of them. But still, I'll just I'll run through them really quick so you can at least know, hey, here's a whole bunch of games at Essen that I've actually done videos for, if you want to know more about them. So, I'll, get, I'll do a quick run-through of those, and then after that, I will We'll be talking about, what is it? Looks like 16 games that you cannot buy at the show, but that will be at the show so that you can play them. And um, these are all games that I am personally very excited about seeking out and trying to get some time at the table to play because they look like they're really interesting. So, uh, that and that right there, that might be the end of the podcast because by that time, I expect... I will have lost my voice entirely. Because how many games is this? I haven't even done the math. It's a lot of games to talk about. If I still have strength, I'll wrap it up with a quick rundown of the promos of the show that should be sought out. And uh, I may or may not get to that. I don't know. Um, another thing that, unfortunately, we won't be getting to is regular Q&A. Uh, I know some people absolutely love that, but this month it's going to be all... Essence spiel all the time. Q and A will return next month, and also I'm way behind on doing my top ten recap, so we'll be trying to get back to all of that next month. But um, this time, it's just going to be about all these games, and also that means I think we won't be hearing from Jen, unfortunately, because while she will be at Essen, uh, she'll be there not to play games, but to sell Gamer Glass. And we'll be uh, talking some more about that. Actually, watch coming soon. I'll be doing a video where, because once again, Jen will be running a contest, and so that'll all be very, very exciting. But enough about that. Are you guys ready? Are you comfortable? Um, do you, uh, have you turned the lights down low? Have you got some mood lighting going on or some mood music? Well, um, tell you what, I'm going to need some of that because this is going to be a rough... Oh, man. I'm just looking at this list. You can't see it. I've just got this big old Excel sheet. It just never ends. Oh, my goodness. Uh, wish me luck, folks. We'll be right back. Okay, folks, are you ready? Right. <laughs> this is going to be absolutely insane. Uh, like I said, 45 games, starting off with the ones at the top of the list... 
Maybe I don't know that much about them. Maybe I'm just a little bit nervous about them. Who knows? All the way down to the number one, or the number, the two, the three, and the four, the ones that I will not leave Germany without in my hot little hands. You know, grab them or die trying kind of situation. Let's start the countdown with number 45. Power Grid, the card game, which is the latest from Friedman Freeze. And, you know, I'm confident this is going to be a good game. In fact, I'm confident this is going to be a fantastic game. The reason it's so high on the countdown is because I'm not confident it's going to be a very good two-player game. Because Power Grid itself is not a great two-player game. And in fact, it's been my experience, more often than not, Friedman Freeze's games generally are so-so at two players. So... While I'm excited about the idea of this, because Power Grid is a phenomenal design, so a card game version of it, that should be really cool. I just, I am nervous. Will it somehow work well with two? I don't know. Uh, but I'm definitely interested in it. So that's number 45, Power Grid, the card game. Then on to 44, Motion Pictures, Movies Out of Cardboard. And, you know, this one is a hard figure. I'd love to put it higher because I am so in love with the theme, uh, you know, basically being able to run your own golden age movie studio. Or actually, no, I don't even think it's golden age. I think it's actually modern era. And you are dividing your time between making movies, making TV shows, making commercials, whatever it might be. Hiring the right talent to be able to put the right stuff together and score a lot of points. I love that. That's it's a wonderful theme. I mean, I worked on the movies, the video game from Lionhead years ago. So I've always loved the, the genre, but... For whatever reason, the publisher has decided to put out almost zero specific concrete information about this game. Publishers who are planning on launching games at Essen Spiel. You know, we're, we're just a bit more than a week away. I'm recording this on a Monday. The show starts next Thursday. Why haven't, why aren't there more games with their rules posted? Why aren't there more screenshots of what this game looks like? Why aren't there videos walking me through it to get me excited, to get me hyped? Right now, all I can go on is the theme. And I love that theme, but they're not giving me much more. So that's why it's at number 44. Motion pictures, movies out of cardboard. Then on to 43. Uh, Die Baumeister des Colosseum, which is German for Builders of the Colosseum. This is another a fine example of a game that could be very, very interesting to me. I've, you know, I've been to the Colosseum in real life. Jen and I, we've both been there. So we have an implicit interest in a game that casts us in the role of the architects, the, the people who actually cr make that incredible wonder of the world. So I'm interested in the theme, and I'm certainly interested in the designer pedigree. It's from Klaus Jürgen Verda. The designer of Carcassonne, and uh, which, if that wasn't enough, also the designer of Rapa Nui, which is a phenomenal, overlooked, little uh, you know, underappreciated gem of a card game. So, you know, Klaus is this is this is his first big game in a while that wasn't just some kind of Carcassonne tie-in. That in and of itself should be interesting. And yet, once again, the publisher gives us nothing other than I believe a, a picture of the board, and that's it. That's not enough. This game. You know, based on the pedigree, based on the theme, should be much, much higher. But again, with, in the absence of information, all I can do is list as number 43, uh, Debaumeister des Colosseum. Then on to number 42, Chariot Race. And actually, uh, the full title, I don't really quite remember. I, I, I should have actually written down the full name of it. But it's Chariot Race, subtitle something, 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 something. I'm really excited about this one. I guess I'm excited about all of these. I mean, if I wasn't excited, I wasn't even going to make the list. So, um, but you know, I, I'm a bit tempered in my excitement for this because while it is from designer Matt Leacock, which is a big, big deal right there. One of my favorite designers of all time, you know, the mastermind behind all things pandemic and Forbidden Desert, who I also love, I also love Roll Through the uh, Ages. So, uh, you know, a Matt Leacock game, instantly going to be interested, instantly going to be pulled in. Particularly because, hey, it's not pandemic themed. It's just like, uh, De Baumeister Coliseum is not a Carcassonne game from Klaus Verda. Hey, Matt Leacock not doing another pandemic or pandemic inspired game like the, uh, what was it? The Thunderbirds he did last year. Totally new game. So I'm super excited. But again, I have to temper that excitement with the fact that this is apparently a dice game, not entirely maybe unlike Roll Through the, Ga uh, Roll Through the Ages, which was a Yahtzee-style civilization game that he did many, many years ago. But 
This one is about recreating races in, in the Coliseum. Hey, actually, I didn't even I put these right next to each other. I didn't even uh, pick up on that. So apparently, it's a race game with a fair bit of take that, and so you are rolling dice as much to be able to succeed and speed ahead as you are to try and attack your opponent and tear them down. So based on Jen's and my predilections, I, it gives me a little bit of pause. But and, and otherwise, you know, this would be in my top twenty. Um, but. I, I'm just a little bit nervous. Is it going to be a turnoff for us if we're constantly at each other's throats trying to rip each other down instead of building ourselves up? That could be the case with Chariot Race, number 42. Then on to number 41, Forestront, which is Forest Restaurant. But one word, Forestront. Isn't that clever? Well, it's kind of a mouthful. It's hard to say, but... I like the idea. This is a game where players are working cooperatively to run a restaurant. It's a restaurant simulation, which is interesting in and of itself. But the restaurant is peopled by anthropomorphized animals. So, unfortunately, once again, this doesn't rate higher because there's almost no information, no pictures. I want to see pictures of the cute animal art to really get me excited about this game. But here we are, a week and a half away, and there's nothing other than the briefest of descriptions. But in spite of that, I'm excited because... I love the idea of a cooperative restaurant simulation where you're having to, um, you know, seat your patrons, deal with the fact that they're getting more and more stressed the longer they have to wait for their food, take care, you know, make the right meals so that they will be happy and pay. Uh, the fact that players are working cooperatively, running off a deck of cards that determines what they can do on their turn, should be very, very cool. This might have rated higher, but, and you know, here's the thing. This, I waited as long as possible. I'm, we're just barely a little bit more than a week away from the show um, because I was trying to give publishers enough time to get information out there so that I could more accurately gauge at least my own personal enthusiasm for these games. And yet, in spite of that, I'm shocked how many of these games still have almost no information. Okay, I think that's the last time I'm going to say it. Uh, Forestrant, the publisher... Get on the ball! Give us some art! Give us the rule book! Get us excited! For number 41, for restaurant. I think I'm saying that right. Anyway, then on to number 40. Kepler 3042, or you know, Kepler and then the year 3042. This is a space exploration colonization game. And the thing that's really interesting to me about it is, you know, it purports to have a very, very hard focus on hard speculative science. This is not just some, this is not like a fantasy game set in outer space like Star Wars or, um, you know, Knights of the Old Republic. That's Star Wars 2 or, you know, uh, uh, Twilight Imperium. You know, these things are just, you know, kind of silly. I mean, this is based on speculative a science fiction about where we are going to be in the year uh, 3042. You know, I mean, so, there's a big, big emphasis on tech trees in this game, but tech trees that, again, are based on our best guesses as to what life will be like in that future. So, I'm intrigued for that reason. And um, from what I know of the gameplay, I'm really intrigued by the notion that this is a resource management game where you start the game with a set amount of resources, and you can use these to run your the engine that that lets you stream across the stars and colonize and all that. But at all times, you have the option to just use that energy in a responsible way, in a, in a slow way, or you can burn that energy. Burn it all up, toss it away, so that you can make leaps and bounds and get lots of bonus stuff. But apparently, there are very, very strict finite resources available. So, um, there's a lot of tension that goes into, the, presumably, that kind of decision of, well, do I just play, do I go slow and steady, like the tortoise, um, or am I like the jackrabbit and I just burn through all my stuff to get where I need to go really fast? That is an intriguing idea to me. And it's interesting, this was on Kickstarter a while ago, it was a successful Kickstarter, and the publisher did contact me to do a run-through for it at the time, and I have to admit, I was really wanted to do one, but the problem was, when they sent me the rules to read at the time, they had only recently been translated from the original Italian, and they were very, very tough to follow, so I ultimately had to say no, because I just, I, I generally don't want to commit to doing a Kickstarter prototype run-through, unless I'm already sure ahead of a time I'm going to like the game, because I don't want to waste anybody's time, um, you know, the publisher's time, my time, Jen's time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So since I couldn't quite grok the uh, early rules translation... 
that I, you know, I ultimately passed on doing a run through for it. But, you know, Lance Meister, Undead Viking, he did one and it actually looked pretty good. So, I'm still excited about this, but, you know, I still just need to know a little bit more. But anyway, that's my number 40, Kepler 3042. Then, on to number 39, Terraforming Mars. Now, when I first heard about this game, I was much, much, much more excited about it. And in fact, uh, this, uh, this game was on the Gen Con, the game, mostly anticipated games of Gen Con podcast I did a few months as well, because it got its North American release, but now it's getting its European release, so that's why it's getting listed in this one. And originally, I listed it really, really high. I think it maybe made my top 10 most anticipated for Gen Con. That anticipation, though, has dropped precipitously in the ensuing months because I have since found out that the game apparently, I have I don't have any first-hand experience here, but apparently has a fair bit of take that in it. It's a a card game where you are trying to build up cards into your tableau to make your um, your engine that is all about terraforming Mars as efficient as possible as we try to get a breathable atmosphere and um, you know habitable environment and all that it's you know it's a very very big ambitious scope of the project we're doing in this game because the game itself lasts for hundreds of years while we terraform Mars and everybody's you know doing their best to be the most successful at it over the course of the game but apparently a lot of the cards in the game are oh I'm going to steal some stuff of yours oh I'm going to destroy the thing that you actually built to slow you down and and I just wonder why is that there oh my gosh everything about this game had me so excited and now um, you know, the thing that actually really tipped my hat that got me nervous was when Tom Vassell did his video review of it. And, you know, he went out of his way to point out the fact that there was all this stuff. Now, he has since actually contacted me and said, well, you know what? I think you could probably just pull all of the nasty attack cards out and it really wouldn't hurt the balance. I'm not sure, but I think that might be the case. But then I read elsewhere that the uh, designers of the game themselves, when asked, said, well... We don't really recommend that because they are kind of crucial to the balance of the overall game. So, long story short, that's why Terraforming Mars, which used to be you know in my top 10 most anticipated games of the year, and with good reason, because everything I've heard is the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal. But I am hedging my bets a little bit because I am a little bit nervous about the take that content in there. And so, that's why it's sitting at number 39. Then, on to 38... Uh, Martians, a story of civilization. Uh, yet another. Mars is the hot topic this year, and um, Martian story of civilization, I believe, is getting its launch at Essen this year. And now this one is not quite so ambitious in the scope of the project. We're not trying to terraform Mars. We're just trying to colonize. It's just the early days of mankind's first baby steps to get off this planet. And the interesting thing, it's not the only game that covers this subject matter. There's a few other ones out there. The interesting thing about this one, more than anything else, is you have the option. It's, it's more of a, a uh, Euro-style resource management game than just about any of the other ones. And it allows you to play either competitively or cooperatively. And now, on the surface, that sounds really great. I love the idea of that. But it always does make me hesitate a little bit because I always wonder, well, if the design process was fundamentally split between trying to make a really solid cooperative game and a really solid competitive game, did they do both equally well? Would they have been better jettisoning one to make the other better? I don't know. That's why it doesn't rate higher because, I mean, I, there, now this one has lots of pictures. The rules are available to download. There's plenty of information out there. But, having not played it, I do worry just a little bit how well... Will, I mean, I'm mostly interested in it as a cooperative game as well, because it seems like all these other Martian games, for the most part, are competitive. Actually, that's not true. There's one that's unfortunately not coming out until next year from Portal Games that's cooperative as well. But for the most part, the, the Martian wave of games have been competitive. This one allows you to play cooperative. I'm excited about that, particularly because it apparently it also has a lot of different scenarios, so you have different cooperative scenarios to play through. That sounds really cool. But, again, will it be as good, or was it really designed at its heart of hearts to be a competitive game? I don't know. Or will the competitive game suffer, or will they both be awesome? Again, I just don't know. That's why I'm hedging my bets and putting it at number 38. Martian, A Story of Civilization. Then, on to number 37. 
Honshu. Now, this is a simple little card game. Uh, looks like it has nice art. And uh, it seems very simple. Actually, it reminds me a lot of uh, The Hanging Gardens, which is a game Jen and I have had for a long time. I've never done a run-through for it, but it's a really excellent game. The notion is that you've got all these cards that have a, you know, have a grid on it with multiple terrains on top of that. And we're all playing cards to the table. And we're playing them, stacking them on top of each other. They're creating kind of this patchwork of cards. And, um, you know, we're trying to make sure our lake spaces are next to lake spaces, our forest spaces are next to forest spaces. But every time we put a new card down, we're potentially covering up other cards. And, again, this is something that works wonderfully in the Hanging Gardens. It works really well in Ravens of Three Shahashri. It works really awesomely in Patch History. So, I'm really, really keen on this notion. And, I'm so, I'm I'm really excited about Honshu. Simple as that. Um, I probably maybe should rate higher, but again, haven't played it yet. So, uh, but I, I'm really, I'm really confident that it should be a very, very solid game. 37 Honshu. Then on to 36 Kingsburg Second Edition. Now. A lot of people are probably very, very excited about this because Kingsburg has been a very well, well beloved. Dice worker placement game. In fact, it was really the first game that popularized the notion of dice worker placement, which is nowadays kind of a, a fairly popular and successful subgenre of game design. But Kingsburg really put it out there. And, uh, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's been out of print for a long time. And now it's been picked up by a new publisher. It's gotten a complete graphical overhaul. And uh, it's getting re-released with... The expansion content, I believe, that came with the game originally, plus some new expansion content, I believe, which wasn't available prior. Now, Jen and I, we did play Kingsburg a long time ago, back when we first got into gaming, and we thought it was actually a pretty cool game. Um, although we did find that if you didn't play the original Kingsburg with the expansion, it got really stale really quick, but the expansion made sure that you know it, it, it was kept fresh. And as hard as it is to find Kingsburg, it's even harder to find the expansion. So it's great that it's coming back out, and the expansion will be available to everybody. Jen's and my problem with it at the time was, and remember, we were still fairly new to designer board games at the time, was for Jen, it was super duper AP inducing. I mean, just like to an epic level. Now, we are much more seasoned gamers these days. So I have to admit, I'm enthused about the notion of going back and trying it again, see if uh, it works better for us. Plus, I'm enthused about the idea of what they've done when they revisited the design. Did they clean anything up and whatnot? Now, I know some people are actually very, very disappointed by the graphical overhaul it got, you know, the new art style. It's, what's the best way to put it? It's much more dry looking. It looks more like a Euro. And I mean, because the original game was like very bright and colorful and vibrant, had a lot of personality. This one is a little bit more staid, a little bit more reserved. And I mean, to me, it looks fine, but I know some people are very, very disappointed. But I, it's not about the art. It's about the gameplay. I already knew the core gameplay was good. Like I said, so this one I'm more excited about going back and trying to see if we have grown as gamers anymore. So that is... But it just doesn't rate higher because, again, we did... Ultimately traded away originally. Maybe we would again. Maybe it's not worth seeking out. That's number 36. Kingsburg, second edition. Then on to number 35. Dream Home. And this looks lovely. It's a game where each player is trying to build their dream home. Their modern little perfect slice of suburbia. I think you can make a two, or I think the house can ultimately be three stories tall. And the, at its heart, it's a card drafting game where every turn there's a bunch of cards out on display. I'll take cards and add them to my home, and then you'll take cards and add them to your home, and so on, until everybody has completed their home, and whoever built the best one, you know, is the, you know, has the best layout of rooms, the best size of rooms, the best interdependencies between rooms uh, makes the best house, wins the game. The interesting thing about the game is, though, the cards that you're drafting from, they're all laid out in a row. And there's actually two rows. A row of room types, and then above that, a row of resources. And what you have to do is, when it's your turn, you have to pick a column, which means you're picking a pair of cards. You're picking a room and you're picking a resource. You have to take both of them, and you have to make use of both of them. And what I suspect is going to be the interesting tension of the game is, wow, I really want that room, but I don't want the resource that's associated with it because it's a hot tub, and I don't have any place in my house to put a hot tub. So I'm going to get stuck with this hot tub because I want this perfect kitchenette that's going to expand my kitchen and make it awesome, but now I'm going to have to do... What am I going to do with this hot tub? I don't know. 
I think that could be really, really cool. Certainly the art that's on display looks really, really nice. So overall, I'm very, very excited about Dream Home, number 35. <laughs> then on to number 34, Habitats. This looks like a very clever little puzzly game where each player is trying to develop their own wildlife nature reserve where uh, you're, we're drafting tiles. And there's a neat little mechanism for drafting the tiles as well. I hadn't really quite seen anything like it. But, um, you know, so that looks cool. But what's even more intriguing about it to me is once you've got the tiles and you're going to add them to your own nature reserve, you know, the, the tiles represent forests and lakes and swamps and grasslands and all the different types of environment that the animals you're trying to make happy and make thrive in your nature reserve, they have everything they need. But here's the thing. When I get the rhino tile and I put it in, the rhino tile will come in. It, it's, it's a tile that has two features to it. It's a rhino, which means, hey, I'm going to try and make a good habitat for rhinos. Um, and it's grassland. Now, what I want to do is I want to put those rhinos down next to another type of animal that needs grassland. But the rhino needs access to water. So I want to make sure I put the rhino tile next to another tile that has grassland on it. So it seems, and again, I haven't played it, so I don't really know, but it seems there's probably, as the game develops and goes on, a very interesting... Uh, Jigsaw puzzle, you know, evolves in front of you as you're drafting to get these tiles that are really great animals to score points, but maybe they don't give you the type of environment you need to make sure your already existing animals are happy. So, do you grab, do you grab these tiles for their landscape or for their animals? And how do you make sure that they all line up together to make the perfect, uh, nature wildlife reserve? I love the idea of it. I love the theme. Um, I know Jen's going to love lots of nice animals. I, I guess the game actually comes with some nice little... They, from the picture, they look like they're little porcelain minis of different types of animals. I'm not really sure about that. I'm, that's kind of a neat little gimmick, but mostly I'm just interested in the game. Number 34, Habitats. Then on to number 33, Morpheus. Now, the reason I'm interested in this one, it's from designer Christoph Matusik. Uh, Matusik. Yeah, who uh, was it last year or was it the year before? Put out the excellent dice worker placement game Thrash and Roll, which was so amazing that it made Jen like it, even though she has such an avowed aversion to heavy the heavy metal theme that it was set in. The gameplay was so rock solid, and so now Kristoff is back with another dice rolling slash worker placement uh, game. Apparently, in this game, Morpheus, we are all competing to replace Morpheus on his throne as the king of dreams or something like that. Because we are dream weavers. It is our responsibility to create the perfect dreams that the mortals down below will, um, it, that will, you know, make society function. Because if people don't dream, they can't think, apparently. So, I don't know much about it. It looks very bright and very colorful, but I'll be honest, I haven't bothered to read the rules yet. I'm mostly excited based on the pedigree of the designer because Thrash and Roll was so phenomenal, and that's why it's on my list at number 33, Morpheus. Then on to 32, Freedom and Freeze returns on the list with Fabled Fruit. And now this one, this is uh, you know, uh, conceptually a very, very exciting idea. It's a apparently a very simple card game, and apparently what we're trying to do is collect fruit. Um, you know, there's different fruits on the different cards. Where you know we get the right types of fruits, we'll score a lot of points. That's our, our sole focus of the game. And apparently, when you start playing the game, it's got very very simple rules. It's a very simple little card game. But what happens is based on what happens during play we will start to unlock additional gameplay rules. That means, because of, basically, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what the, the parameters are, but maybe uh, because a certain milestone, like you got a number a number of limes, I, I, I'm making this up, but a player gets 15 limes in a given game, oh my gosh, that means we've unlocked the lime module. And now, the next time we play, the core rules have evolved and adapted and changed based on what we did in a previous game. And then after we play that next Next session, hey, the lime rule stays, but now some lemon rule gets added, or apple rules get added, or I don't even know what they are. I haven't really looked into this too much, because in all honesty, I don't want it spoiled. I am so enamored of this idea of a game that the more we play, the more it evolves. And you keep going back, and it gets bigger and deeper and richer and more complex as more and more rules get layered in the more we play this game. 
Now, it's interesting. They are positioning this game as the kind of anti-legacy because it has, you know, the the main thing that pretty much everybody loves about legacy games uh, um, is the notion that the more you play, the more the game evolves. The the rules get bigger and deeper and richer. All that stuff I just said. But what people don't like about legacy is that once those new rules get introduced to the game, the game is permanently changed forever. You can never go back to the way it was. You can't ever reset because legacy games make you rip up cards. They make you actually write on cards or apply stickers and make permanent non um you know un, un, un you know the changes that get added to the game cannot be undone F- um fabled fruit introduces instead of it being a legacy game it's a fable game which is to say yeah in a legacy style you keep adding all these new rules and the game evolves it gets bigger and better and cooler um you know as a direct result of your experiences and your actions and your decisions but anytime you want you can undo all of it and reset it back to its virgin state where it's just a simple little card game. So, that's very cool. I love the idea of that. I love everything about this game. It should be in my top 10 most excited games. In all honesty, here's why it's not. Well, I already mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about Power Grid the card game. It's from Freedom and Freeze. And again, Freedom and Freeze does not have the best track record making really solid two-player games. It's interesting. This reminds me less of a legacy game and more Freedom and Freeze's, you know, um, magnum opus from last year, 504, which if you remember I run through, I really respected the heck out of that game. I thought it was so brilliant. And I, I was just so bummed that it was just not very good for two players. It, its design really needed more players at the table to make it come alive. I am so terrified that's what's going to happen for Fabled Fruit and it just won't hold up as a two-player game because I so want to play this game. I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited about these ideas, but i got to hedge my bets until I find out firsthand, is it a good two-player experience? Because that's the only way me and Jen are going to play it, or Jen and I are going to play it. So anyway, that's why it's at number 32, Fabled Fruit. Now moving on to number 31, The Daedalus Sentence which is a cooperative prison break game set on a futuristic space station. Apparently, it's actually it's, it's, a, it's a prisoner of war camp. Uh, humanity has been all but wiped out by this invading alien race, and some surviving humans are captured and taken to this POW camp where um, you know, they're experimented on by the aliens and all kinds of stuff like that, and they are just trying to escape. So... The theme is cool. Like all that, that sounds cool and exciting and neat and atmospheric. But what's really cool about this game is, like I said, it's on a space station. And this space station is a series of concentric rings. With At the very, very center of the entire space station is the cells that at the beginning of the game, hey, you know what? Somehow we broke out of our cell. And now we're going to spend the entire game trying to get from the center of the space station to the uh, escape pods that are all the way on the outermost concentric circle. So we have to go from the inner circle through these outer circles. But here's the thing. All these concentric circles are rotating. Because it's a space station. And they might rotate clockwise. They might rotate counterclockwise. So the entire maze that we are trying to escape from is in motion. You know, it, not this game doesn't come with batteries. It's not like it's a constant motion. But there's a puzzle element to it. That at the end of every round, um, the station is going to rotate. And, you know, the guards you're trying to avoid, you might have thought, hey, I'm safe. I'm, they're nowhere near me. But then the station rotates. And, oh, my gosh, they're right outside. What am I going to do? And, oh, I thought I was going to get over to the weapons locker. But, oh, no, now it's rotated and there's a lock door between us. That sounds really cool. And I've seen pictures of it. It, it, Basically, the way it works is uh, it comes with this big tray, and you populate the tray. Every time you play, you're going to get a randomly generated uh, um, space station with all these different rooms all over the place, and you basically are able to rotate each ring independently of each other. So I love the idea of it. It sounds really, really cool. I can't, I can't wait to give it a try. That's number 31. I, um, you know, And so basically, at this point, obviously, I'm getting to the stuff where you know, I, I don't. I don't really have much hesitation. Everything up until now, I've had some kind of hesitation. That makes me think. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. With Daedalus sentence, I'm pretty confident that this. I mean, this idea is so cool. The gimmick of it that you know kind of reminds me of the gears in Sulkin. You know, a board that's constantly in motion. Or oh, what's the other cooperative game that I love? Uh, Forbidden Desert. A, a board that's constantly in motion. I've had great experiences with that in the past, so I'm very excited about number 31, Daedalus Sentence. Then on to number 30. And honestly, I almost put this on my list of most excited expansions, which will be coming later in this podcast. But you know, I knew people would 
would have a cow, man, if I did that. But here's the thing. I'm only thinking about this as an expansion. What is it? Number 30, codename pictures. Because in all honesty, we already have code names. We think code names is awesome. We have a party game. If we ever need to have a game where a whole bunch of people have to be uh, entertained, not that that's ever likely to happen, but if it ever does, hey, we've got, we can bring out code names. It works. I played it. We played it just as a two player game. I played it with a bunch of players. It's just a phenomenal design. Holds up to multiple replays. Absolutely great. What does code name pictures do? It just takes the words out and replaces them with pictures. Game stays exactly the same. I don't really need codename pictures. The thing I'm most excited about it, though, is not as a standalone game, which it works as a totally standalone game. That's why I've listed it in the, in the games countdown. I want it as an expansion for codenames because there's a variant rule where you can mix and match pictures and words. That sounds very, very exciting to me. I'm really intrigued by that. And so I look forward to Codename Pictures as an expansion to Codenames. Okay, and then... Uh, but and, and the only reason it's not higher is because I've already got Codenames. And I, I don't expect this to really, you know, fundamentally you know, blow my socks off. I'm just... This will be fun. It'll be a, a nice little expansion, some new content for Codenames. All righty. Then on to number 29. Treasure Lair. Now, this is a uh, fantasy adventure game um, where you are... Let's see, wait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I see, I'm getting this mixed up with another one. Um, actually, number 29 is Treasure Lair. Number 28 is Risky Adventure. Which one is which? Uh, see, I was just doing all my studying. I mean, actually, I should say, I, I, I spent so much time cramming for this, and now I'm starting to get it mixed up. Let's see. Treasure Lair... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that's the one from AEG. Treasure Lair is an interesting game. Um, in all honesty, I'm mostly keen on this one because lately AEG has been on a tear. They've been producing good game after good game after good game. And this looks like a good, solid adventure card drafting game with some really nice art. The, the central conceit is, you know, we are adventurers. We're going out, you know, trying to, you know, find fortune and glory and score a lot of victory points in the form of treasure and all that. That's all cool. But the method we use to, um, travel through the world and fight monsters and then, you know, plunder dungeons or whatever, is a card draft. There are, at any given time, on display, three action cards that give you a primary and a secondary action that you can do. And on your turn, they're, they're all out there on public display. You pick one of them. And so that very harshly limits you in what you can do. And after I pick that one, that card is gone, a new one comes out, and that's going to... Then the next player, your opponent, has those three cards to pick from. So card drafting always works in a, in a well-designed game um, it's just, to such a high degree, I put it in my top 10 gameplay mechanisms. I love card drafting. So anytime I see a new way to use card drafting, I'm instantly excited. I'm excited here because I, I love this, this action card draft. There's a primary, there's a secondary. You know, I really want that secondary action. I don't want the primary action. Um, but you know, uh, I, so I could take that card, it's good for me, but oh my gosh, if you get to take this card, that's exactly what you need to do, and you're gonna, so maybe I should take that card so you don't get it. I mean, all this drafting stuff just works. I'm putting it in this fantasy adventure setting. Um, I'm excited. I, I cannot wait to learn more about Treasure Lair. Then, um, anyway, that was number, 20, number 29, Treasure Lair, and then number 28 is Risky Adventure, which is another fantasy adventure game. This time from Queen Games instead of uh, AEG, if I recall correctly. Um, where, once again, we have a group of adventurers and they are um, traveling around, you know, uh, traveling the world, seeking fortune and glory, fighting monsters, getting treasures, etc., etc. Same basic setting. The, the, the conceit, the gameplay conceit for this one is that basically you have three adventurers. On your turn, you deploy one adventurer to the, the nearby, you know, um, oh, what is it? I think... There's like three places they can go. One goes to like a dungeon that's currently active. One goes to uh, to uh, a countryside that's active, and one goes someplace else. But anyway, they, they, you, you deploy your three adventurers, one to each of these three areas, and you have to make an interesting. You know, one of the areas there's there's some cards that are out. One is there's a little board you can travel on. Anyway, so you, you deploy them, and um, then what you do is oh well, how does this work? All oh, right, all oh, right, all oh, right, all oh, right, all right. So you deploy them to spaces that show that, oh, to be successful here, you need these symbols. To be successful here, you need these symbols. And so you deploy them saying, all right, okay, for all three of my guys to be successful, I need to have these three symbols and these two symbols and this one symbol or whatever you know the symbols are that represent fighting and treasure or whatever. Then after you've deployed them all, you roll the dice 
um, and hope that you roll the symbols you need for those three adventures to succeed at the places you sent them. So, at the beginning of your turn, you've got this tough choice of where do I want to go, and you know what are the three places I send my guys to, so that I will up my chances of all of them being successful. Uh, do I do I make sure that they all go so there's a wide variety of symbols, so that no matter what I roll, chances are at least one or two of them will be successful. Do I double down, and um, then once I roll the die, do I start using my resources to re-roll and do dice luck mitigation and whatnot? I mean. On the whole, it sounds like a really cool idea. And it's, the thing that really caught my attention is from designer Anthony Rubio, who has previously designed Space Sheep and Renaissance Man. And those were both very cool, very original, really unique, far-out game designs, quite unlike anything else out there. I was so impressed by those that I, you know, Risky Adventure instantly got was very, very interesting because this one seems significantly lighter than his previous games. You know, I mean, de- deploy your adventures... Then roll the dice and then mitigate those dice. And, uh, you know, it, sh- it looks really cool. It's from Queen Games, so it has very, very nice art. I'm very, very excited for number 28, Risky Adventure. Then on to 27, Tuluva Deluxe. And the interesting thing is, even though I've never done a run-through for it, I own Tuluva. I mean, sooner or later, I'm going to do a run-through for it. It's a tile-laying game where players are building up this tropical island. Everybody's laying tiles in the same place and trying to make sure that the village huts that represent their little civilization are better situated on this island than your opponents to score the most points. But the interesting thing about this is you lay tiles out um, adjacent to existing tiles, but you also stack tiles that represent volcanoes that erupt that make the landscape climb higher and higher and higher higher and higher. It's a really cool game. We've had our copy forever, and it's been out of print forever. It's been very, very hard to find. I got lucky and just found it, um, you know, for like a, a, you know, for like 10 euros or something like that at some German game shop years ago. And Jen, I really enjoy it. But it's been, no one's been able to get it for a long time. So it's now finally gotten a deluxe reprint. And apparently it's going to be launching at Essen. And apparently this deluxe reprint, you know, um, you know, revamps the art, makes it a bit more modern and sleek looking, but it also adds a bunch of new gameplay modules. So that's exciting. I want to know more about that. Um, although I, you know, I don't know if I really need it because Tuluva itself is fine. So how much do I need this deluxe version? I mean, I can't imagine the game's been out of print for so long. I can't imagine they're going to do an upgrade for people like me who got the original. So do I just live with my original or do I get the new one? I don't know, but that's number 27, Tuluva Deluxe. Then on to 26, Miduris which is M-E-D-U-R-I-S, I believe. And now, this one is interesting because last year at Essen, game publisher Haba, who is known the worldwide for being um, one of the most reliable publishers of really lovely, wonderful, fun children's board games. You know, games designed for kids from, you know, three to six, three to eight. You know, games that uh, I've always been jealous of because they look so lovely and they've got so many clever gimmicks and whatnot, but they're designed for little kids and we don't have little kids. So what was interesting is last year, Haba announced, hey, you know what? We're making games that are not just for kids, that are for the rest of the family. And they put out Karuba and Adventureland. I've done run-throughs for both of these and they're both phenomenal games. Karuba made my top 10 of last year. It was so great. So this year, Haba is back, and they're doing a, hey, let's make some more games for families. And this is the one that's interesting to me, Miduris, which is, I, I don't really know much about what it is. I haven't read the rules yet. I'm pretty confident it's going to be good, just based on the pedigree of what came last year, Adventureland and Karuba. Uh, but it's a gather resources to build up your little civilization and you know make offerings to the gods type thing. You know, standard stuff. I'm sure it will be presented very nicely, but it's just based on last uh, Haba's success last year at making really wonderful gateway, gateway slash plus games that Jen and I really enjoyed. Oh, there's one more thing that's exciting about Maduris as well. It is from the design duo of Stefan Dora and Ralph. Ralph Zerlinda. And whenever these guys get together, they make magic. You know, Milestones, Pergamon. Actually, I don't think Stefan Dora was on Finca. I think uh, Ralph did that by himself. But these are some really phenomenal designs. So once again, it shows Haba is going out, working with some of the best Euro designers in the business. Um, you know, last year it was what Rudiger Dorn for Karuba and Kramer and Kiesling for Adventureland. This year he went out and got Dora and Linda. And so I expect this is going to be Fantastic. Number 26, Maduris. Then, on to number 25, London Dread. This, 
I'm super duper stoked for it. It is a Victorian era cooperative adventure game where players are running around London trying to foil some nefarious plot. Um, you know, and it's not the only game that, you know, features this subject matter, but what's really exciting about this is it's real time cooperative programming. And, you know, if you may have noticed recently, I raved quite a bit about the real-time cooperative programming game Mechs vs. Minions. And years ago, there was another game that I've always been sad that Jen and I can't enjoy, Space Alert, uh, which is also another real-time cooperative programming game. I love that game so much that even though Jen and I didn't enjoy it because of certain design decisions, it made it into my top 10 games I was most sad to see go. I recently did that top 10. Um, so... I love cooperative real-time programming as a concept. So one that um, you know creates a really strong sense of storytelling in Victorian London, so, you know, solving mysteries and and all of that while real-time programming. And it also features a uh, optional app that you know has dramatic story reading and does the timer stuff for you. I'm really excited about this. Ever since I first heard about it. And apparently it got a uh, launch at Gen Con, where it was fairly well-received, so now it's getting its European launch. So I cannot wait, cannot wait, to uh, find out more about London Dread. My only worry with it... Should I be... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not worried, I'm not worried. It looks like it might be a little bit of Meritrashy. Maybe. I don't know. But still, I love app-based games. I love real-time... Co- I mean, if it's real-time cooperative programming, how Meritrashy can it be, really? I'm confident, I'm excited, number 25... London Dread. Then, on to number 24. Legendary Inventors. This one... Uh, this one just kind of tickles my funny bone. Because uh, players get a handful of cards, and you're drafting for more cards throughout the game. I'm not really quite sure how. didn't really look that closely. But the cards represent famous inventors from all eras of mankind. I mean, um, Einstein, and Aristotle, and um, Alchemides, and... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, George Washington Carver? I don't know, I don't know. But tons and tons of famous inventors throughout time. And what players are doing is you've got these inventors, and all the inventors have different strengths in, you know, different disciplines, physics or chemistry or whatnot. I'm sure Madame Curie will, you know, be, have her own strengths compared to Albert Einstein. But the thing is, you, um, we mix and match. We, we have like a greatest scientific mashup. Why not have Archimedes hang out with Galileo and Madame Curie to develop this great new invention? That's the theme of the game. I love that theme. That just looks so cool, so exciting. So much so I haven't really spent too terribly much time paying attention to the actual gameplay just because I love the theme so much. (laughs) And um, that's why Legendary Inventors is sitting at my number 24. Then number 23, Robinson Crusoe. Now this, like, um, what was it? What did I talk about earlier? Oh, number 36, Kingberg, second edition. This is a game Jen and I played before. We've owned it before. And we liked it quite a bit, but we got rid of it for certain reasons. In fact, oh, um, like Space Alert I just mentioned, Robinson Crusoe also made it into my top ten games. I I was so sad to get rid of because it was so good, but it just didn't work for us. Robinson Crusoe is a brilliant, cooperative retelling of the Robinson Crusoe classic literary fiction. It came with a whole bunch of different... Scenarios. So every time you play, you could have um, you know problems with natives trying to set up to uh, you know a bonfire to you know draw attention to a rescue uh, volcanoes, all kinds of stuff. All these really cool different scenarios. And the gameplay itself was it was basically a cooperative worker placement game, which at the time. That was a pretty cool new idea that nobody else had really done, and it had this really awesome event system. Is you explored the island. You would draw these cards, and if you chose to take advantage of the resources these cards would give you, they would have a dark side. You would put them back in the event deck, and then later on, when they got drawn a second time, they would have some calamity that would befall you. So this awesome system of bird in the hand, but... Um, or not, not burn the hand two in the bush, but uh, not stitch in time saves nine. But basically, this idea that you know there will be consequences if I take this, it will hurt me later was absolutely brilliant. The reason we got rid of it was well, Jen doesn't like co-op games that are unrelenting, and it was pretty unrelenting. So I and you know, but again, this was we got this game fairly early on in our modern designer board game career, gamer career. Maybe 
Jen will um, appreciate it a little bit more. She won't be pushed off by it as much with this new reprint, which apparently revamps the rules. I, I guess it, it, it does like a new box cover. It doesn't really change the art. just revamps the rules, maybe updates the components a little bit. It's still the same basic game. My problem with the original game was that it was a, it was a hybrid game. It mixed and matched... Euro-style gameplay mechanisms with Ameritrash-style dramatic narrative storytelling. And for me, there was too much of the dramatic um, narrative storytelling that overweighed... The, you know, that stuff in, in, intruded a bit too much into the Euro-style gaming for me. And Jen just didn't like it because it was just way too harsh and unforgiving and unrelenting in the pressure it put us under. Still... I kind of want to try it again. I kind of do. And that's why it's number 23 on the list. Robinson Crusoe. I guess is it second edition? I'm not quite sure. Anyway, and moving on to number 22, Capital. And this is from Granite Games designer uh, Philip uh, Malinsky. Uh, Malinsky. And I'll, there's one reason this is on my list, and this is on my list quite so high. CV. Grana and Philip... Previously gave us CV. CV is on my personal top 10, not my top 10, what was it? Top 10 must-have games. I've, uh, basically, I mean, if, oh, it was on my Desert Island games. That If I had to only have 10 games on a Desert Island, CV would have made it. So here's um, the same publisher slash designer bringing a new game. So I have to be interested. Even though this one has nothing to do with CV, this is a game that tells the history of the city Warsaw, which is... Um, Fairly well-renowned for having survived so many wars, so many attacks. And the, today, Warsaw is kind of a patchwork city with all kinds of different architecture from all these different time zones that you know kept on going through wars and getting raised to the ground, but then kept getting built back up. This game, as near as I can tell from reading the description, tries to capture that. Because it the whole game goes through six epochs of the evolution of Warsaw. It's a tile lane game where we're building up Warsaw over time and building new buildings on top of old buildings... But then at various points in the game, war will come and it will raise portions of the city to the ground. And so that will set us back, but it will also give us great opportunities to build new and better. And as as we see, the architecture change and evolve over time. That's a really cool idea. I would be intrigued by that gameplay proposal anyway, but the fact that it's from... The the folks who gave me CV means it has to go relatively high on my list at number 22, Capital. Then, number 21, Barcelona, The Rose of Fire. And now this is interesting. This is from the designers of War of the Rings, which is a game I'm never going to play because it's a very well-respected war game set in the Lord of the Rings universe. Um, well, well loved. But this one is not about war at all. It's another... Euro-style city-building game. Wow, and actually, that's, this is totally random. Capital is about Warsaw. Barcelona City of Fire is about Barcelona getting built up as a city. Um, it's just a total coincidence. They're right next to each other but in this list. I didn't even notice that till now. But anyway, so like I said, this is about the, um, the building and evolution of Barcelona instead of Warsaw. And the interesting thing about this game is... Well, as the architects of Barcelona, we want to build the most wonderful, prestigious, beautiful buildings there are because those score us the most points. But to build these buildings, workforce is drawn to Barcelona and comes into the city. And that workforce, I guess, is represented by a bag full of workers. So I build a building. It, um, the workers who I use to build that building then go into the bag. Here's the thing. The bigger and more prosperous the city gets with all these wonderful, prestigious buildings that me and my opponents are building the more the workers who are coming need to have places to live as well. And so we have to divide our time between building these wonderful, luxurious, prestigious buildings, they'll score us a lot of points, and building low-rent living accommodations for, all, for, the, uh, for the workforce to be able to live and thrive and be happy. And here's the thing. If we, do, if we only go for the prestigious stuff, eventually, I mean, I guess every round, the more and more workers um, that come to the city to build our great stuff, they go into the bag. Every round, we're drawing from that bag. And if we draw from the bag, and in addition to the workers coming out, I think a black cube, I think that's what it was, comes out, that means they riot. Because we have not been taking care of them enough, and so they will turn. Our own workforce will turn against us. That sounds awesome. I love everything about um, what this game is trying to simulate. The you know, and so I, I again, I haven't read the rules. I don't need to. Just that. I mean, actually, I should. I really, I am kind of 
uh, wing and a prayer there. But that core idea sounds so compelling to me. I really want to explore it. I really want to experience it. And that's why we have at number 21, Barcelona, Rose of Fire. Wow, folks, we made it through 25 so far. We're making good time. Um, and I am out of water. I think I'm just going to take a breather for a second. I'll be right back with number 20. Hold on. Okay, everybody. <laughs> We're back. Top 20 time. Are you ready? Uh, I am. No, I'm not. I'm so tired. I'm, oh, I'm just ready. Okay. No whining. Must be strong. Soldier on. Number 20. <laughs> Rhine River Trade. And now this is from a design duo of Marco Canetta and uh, Stefano Nicolini. And you may not have heard of them. You know, they're not necessarily household game, uh, household names in the game designer market. But man, this design team, well, Zanguo and Doship. These are both fantastic designs. The gen I really enjoyed a lot. Although, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Doship turned out to be a little bit too mean for us. But Zanguo is a masterpiece of game design. And so, uh, anytime these two get together, plus, hey, one of them is a girl. More girl designers making really, really top-tier, absolutely phenomenal Euro game designs. So, whenever they get together, they put out a new game, I am interested. And so, I'm interested in Rhine River Trade. The game itself is actually interesting, too, because it is a goods transportation game, which is certainly a, the a theme we've seen a lot in games. But it's interesting. Most of the time, this is set in Renaissance era or you know Antiquities era. This one, Rhine River Trade, is set today. And it is all about transporting goods up and down the Rhine by um, you know train, plane, truck, and ship. You thought I was going to say train, plane, and automobiles. Almost. So, I'm interested in the theme because you just don't see... I mean, it, 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 I mean don't get me wrong. I love Renaissance-era games. I love antiquity-era games. But I'm excited to see more modern-era good shipping games, too. And um, more importantly, this design duo... I mean, you know, they've got a pass. I don't need to read the rules. They, they, they're producing quality stuff. So that's why Rhine River Trade is number 20. Then moving on to number 19, Natillion, which is the latest game in the Oniverse series, which is what what's in the Oniverse series? Um Onorum and and uh Sylveon and Castellion and one more that I've never played. And now uh Natillion, which I guess is a it's set in the same Oniverse. And Oniverse is, I guess, a, a dream world uh, with just really wonderful, bright, colorful, charming, but surreal art. And every one of the games in this series, they're designed as solo games, but they also work really, really well as two-player co-op games. Jen and I enjoyed every single one of them. And every single one you know, takes some new gameplay mechanism, whether it was Tile Lang and Castellion or, um, you know, kind of a cooperative tower defense in Sylveon, or, you know, card uh, set collection in Onorim. This one, it's dice. So, every time they do a new gameplay genre, but they come up with very cool, fresh, original gameplay mechanisms, and really great, fun, cooperative gameplay. Jen and I have enjoyed every one of these games. So, sight unseen, I'm going in. I don't need to read the rules. I don't even want to read the rules ahead of time for Natillion. I don't want to spoil the surprise. There's another thing that's great about these games, Z-Man Games. The love and attention and craftsmanship they put into the presentation of these games. Opening up these boxes is a little miniature event. So, I don't want to know anything about the game. I just know it's a mu it's We're getting into must-have territory now, folks. Still kind of on the fence uh, about some of these. Um, but, but, you know, at this point, the only reason these don't rate higher is because the stuff that's higher is just mind-bogglingly phenomenal. <clears throat> and I have every confidence that uh, number 19, Natillion, is going to be fantastic. But now let's talk about number 18 from designer Uwe Rosenberg, who used to be my favorite designer of all time. Uh, and I, I still greatly respect the man. But number 18, A Feast for Odin. You know, when I made this list, I was really surprised that when the... Uh, when... Everything was in place, and I had uh, arranged everything. This only came in at 18. This is Uve's big, heavy Euro. And in years past, when he was putting out, oh, you know, um, Gates of Lo Yang and uh, Oren Labora and Agricola and Lahav and Mercator, I mean, you know, a big Uve, heavy, economic, 
resource management, Euro simulation. Oh my gosh, I'd be all over it. It'd be my number one most anticipated game of the year. But these days, after Caverna and after Fields of Arla, don't get me wrong, those were phenomenal designs, but I've just been, I've gotten a little nervous that he no longer, his design principles are not aligned with what Jen and I enjoy in board game design because his last two games, Field of Arla and Caverna, were so wide open, were such big sandbox games that ultimately we got rid of them. And I worry, will the same thing happen for A Feast for Odin? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic because, well, I got to watch uh, Michael Visner's uh, MeWe's excellent run-through of the game, and so that gave me a lot of confidence it's going to be great, because this game features... Everybody, right at the get-go, gets an objective card, and over the course of the game, you can get more objective cards, and that gives you direction, that gives you purpose. Um, I've still... I, I, I mean, you know, this doesn't rate in the top 10 only because I was just... Only, only because of the recent games he's put out, but... I know it's going to be great. I mean, heck, I could tell it was great for Miwi's run through. I know it's going to be a phenomenal design. The only question is, will it be too sandboxy? I'm cautiously optimistic. It's at number 18. It's a feast for Odin. Oh my gosh, and I can't believe, I totally forgot. I'm just going to slip this in here right now. Cottage Garden, which is interesting, coming right after Feast for Odin, because it's also from Uwe Rosenberg and uses some of the same mechanisms, the whole notion of this kind of patchwork Tetris pieces that all snap together to you know build your board as you go. And you saw this from Uwe Rosenberg in the past with patchwork, so he's revisiting that idea. And I gotta admit, I'm actually really interested in this because patchwork was a lovely little game. And it's kind of funny to me, I'm genuinely speaking a bit more excited about it than I am about Feast for Odin, which is just kind of odd. So this is definitely one to look for. I can't believe I totally forgot it on the actual main list. But anyway, Let's keep going. Then, on to number 17. Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Which, you know, this is on the list. This is another one where, hey, oh, who designed it? Okay, forget about it. Um, this goes high, high, high on my list. Because the, the design team, they've worked on Zolkin. They've worked on Grand Austria Hotel. They've worked on Agizia. Not necessarily any of those games altogether, but these designers have all had their hands in these really phenomenal designs. And now they've come together to make a worker placement game that's interesting. What I like about the idea is, you know, we have a bunch of workers who are going to get placed, um, but our workers all have different symbols on them. And we put our workers out and, you know, uh, the symbols on them are tied to symbols that are on the dice. And at the beginning of a round, we roll the dice that will determine how strong our uh, let's see, I don't remember what the symbols were, but they were like, they were color coded too. I think there was a black die, a white die, and a brown die or something like that. And so everybody has a, uh, you know, a, a, a matching black worker, white worker, worker, and brown worker. And so when I roll these dice, oh, this round, all the white workers are going to be kind of weak and all the brown workers are going to be kind of strong. And, um, you know, that actually, based on the dice roll, changes the dynamics of my workforce. And so what I thought I was going to do with my workers, I'm not going to be able to do that this round because because of the dice roll. And next round, I mean maybe the 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 uh, white worker will be uh, strong and the and the you know the black worker will be weak. I don't know much about it. That's all I know. This one little fundamental shift to the basic idea of worker placement, gathering resources, using them to convert into victory points that we've seen so many times, but the fact that my workforce is dynamic and fluctuating in its effectiveness based on dice rolls, that sounds really cool. So I'm excited about that. But more so, I'm excited about this um, design trio that's getting together because they have put together so many great games in the fact. That's why Lorenzo El Magnifico rates at number 17. Then on to number 16, Ulm, which is U-L-M, Ulm. And uh, this is another one where designer pedigree really um, drew my attention. So I'm about to say, uh, uh, Gunther Burkhart who uh, was one of the co-designers of Sealand, which is an absolutely phenomenal game. But, you know, that in and of itself is enough to put it on the list. The thing that put it in my top 20 at number 16 is the gameplay mechanism. I'm really excited about this. It's the notion that there is... I guess this little three by three grid of, of, uh, action chips that, you know, all, this little grid of chips that have icons that represent the different actions you can do in this Euro economic simulation. 
where uh, I forget what we're doing. I think we're building up a city again, if I recall correctly. I don't, even, I, I, I don't even remember what the theme was. I was just so enamored of this when I, when I read about and understood how this gameplay mechanism works. So you've got this three by three grid of actions you can do. You've got your own ship that has an action on it at the beginning of the turn. What you do is you take that ship, you put it on the edge of this three by three grid, and you slide it into the grid, which pushes out another chip. And so now what you get to do is you get to do all three actions that just moved on the grid, the the one you slid in and the other two, and the chip that slides out becomes the basis of the action you're going to do on your next turn. That is awesome. That is mind-bogglingly brilliant. I am so in love. Just I mean just that simple little puzzle of a resource action management game Oh my gosh, that is so brilliant. I cannot wait to try that. I, I'm, I'm really, really excited. So much so, I don't care about the art. I don't, I mean, well, okay, I care about the designer too, but I mean, I, I want to play that game. That is such a brilliant idea. And that's why number 16 is Ohm. Then, let's move on to number 15. Turia, T-O-U-R-I-A, Turia. I guess that's the name of the, the mystical fantasy kingdom of Turia, where both the prince and the princess of the kingdom are looking to get hitched. And so we are a bunch of heroes who are trying to prove our worth to marry up in the world and become... Um, I don't know. If you marry, do you become the prince if you marry the princess, but there's already a prince? I don't know. But anyway, we're trying to marry into royalty. So what we have to do, we have to travel around the countryside doing great deeds, earning lots of money, and um, proving our worth. Here's how we do it, though. This is another game that has what strikes me as a really brilliant action selection mechanism. There are four towers on the four corners of the board. Each tower is four-sided. These are vertical towers. So imagine, if you will, a little tower, and on each side is an action. Now, where you're sitting at the table... You can see one side of each of the towers. So I can see that the towers, it gives me a move action and a fight action and a mine action and another move action. I don't know. I don't even know what the actions are. But anyway, I can see four actions from where I'm sitting. You, you're sitting opposite me. You see the opposite side of these four towers. And now here's the deal. On my turn, I'm going to pick one of these actions that's available that I can see on the towers. And then that, t- that action I chose, I will rotate that tower. And thereby giving myself access to a new action and giving you, giving everybody else at the table, depending on where they're sitting relative to these towers, new actions available to them. That really tickles my fancy. This is another example of a game where the board comes alive, where the mechanisms you know, aren't internalized in a series of cards or action points, but, you know, are actually physically represented on the board in a way that is alive and dynamic and constantly moving. I love that. So I'm really, just like Ohm before it, I am so excited about this gameplay mechanism. I can't wait to try it. But not for nothing, I am also excited by the design pedigree, Incas and Marka brand, this husband and wife team. Hey, another phenomenal world-class female board game Euro designer. Awesome possum for all the folks who keep saying, where are the girl designers? You know what? They're, they're out there. You just got to look for them. Um, Inca and Marcus Brand, they do really phenomenal designs. Uh, Murano is great. Village, absolutely phenomenal. My Village, absolutely incredible. They put out good games. This sounds like a really, really cool gimmick of an action selection mechanism. Can't wait to try number 15, Turia. Then on to number 14, Doodle. China. And I have to admit, I am so surprised. I don't know how I missed Doodle City. This is a game that came out years ago. It's a, I guess it's a dice drafting game where you're drafting dice that let you draw Doodle streets and roads on a, uh, a map. And I mean, Somehow I missed that all those years ago when it came out, even though it was a fairly well-liked, well-respected, well-received game. But anyway, they are now putting out Doodle China, which is basically a re-implementation of Doodle City, where uh, which adds a bunch of new rules, and now you're working in China instead of some no-name city called Doodle City. And uh, I missed it. I don't want to miss it again. So I'm very, very excited about this. And in large part, I'm excited about it's from the same designer slash publisher of Avenue, which if you watch my run-throughs, you know, we recently did a live broadcast of Avenue. Oh my gosh, that game is so phenomenal. Absolutely adore it. This is Doodle China is the same basic, you know, doodling on a map, drawing roads, trying to create a, a network 
of connected roads to score points, but um, you know, Avenue was it was it was based on a bingo mechanism. Here it's based on dice drafting. So I am excited. I will finally get to experience the Doodle City that everybody else has been playing for years, apparently, in the form of number 14, Doodle China. Then on to number 13. Pandemic Iberia. This is another one that surprised me. I fully expected Pandemic to make it into my top 10, probably even my top 5. Um, just because, hey, it's Pandemic. And I love Pandemic. And I love Matt Leacock. And I love new shades, new tricks added to Pandemic. And uh, so, I, don't get me wrong, I'm very excited. This is what? My number, um, my number 13 on the list? Of course I'm excited. But, Oh man, it only just goes to say how exciting numbers um, 12 through 1 are that they pushed a pandemic Iberia to number 13. But what is it? It's a it's a new pandemic game where like Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu, it takes the basic pandemic formula but sets it in an entirely new setting. This one, I believe, if I recall correctly, is 1800 Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. And um, we are still running around trying to fight the, not the spread of, of modern diseases, but actually real-world historical diseases of the time. Uh, yellow fever and a typhoid, I forget what they are. But, um, you know, so it's got a historically grounded context for the, you know, trying to stop the spread of disease and, and cure the populace. But it adds new features to the game. The main one is that, you know what, back in uh, the Iberian Peninsula in the 1800s, you couldn't hop a plane to go wherever you needed to go. It took a long time to get from one side to the other. So getting around is no longer quite as easy. And so a big focus of the game, what, what the main thing that is now added to the pandemic formula is route building, where players can spend their time and effort fighting back diseases, trying to find cures, but also building up a network of rails so that we can travel very quickly from one side to the other. And that is actually crucial to winning. This is something that would never make sense putting into a modern day pandemic because why do I need to build railroads around the world? I'll take a plane, thanks. But uh, that's a beautiful thing that changing the setting can add this whole new facet to the already brilliant formula of pandemic. So I can't wait to play it. And actually, full disclosure, I already have. I got to play an early prototype of it. Gosh, was it two years ago now or a year and a half ago? Something like that. Um, at BGGCon. Was it last year or the before? I mean, uh, time's lost all meaning. I've been talking for so long, folks. But we got to play an early version of it. I thought it was very, very cool. I can't wait to see how the final product turned out. Number 13, Pandemic Iberia. And let's see. Number 12. Oh, getting close, but oh, oh, my, my throat is just swollen like a grapefruit. And I've just barely gotten started. Number 12, First Class Unterwegs im Orient Express, which is German for riding the Orient Express, basically. This rates so high because of the designer, Helmut Olre. And this was a guy who actually, I guess, used to design 18xx maps like crazy, and he kind of got his start doing that. But a few years ago, he was the co-designer on Russian Railroads, which is one of the best worker placement games that has come out in the last five years. Absolutely phenomenal game. Uh, speaking of which, I'll be talking more about Russian Railroads when I get over to the expansion content later in the, uh, in the podcast. But, Helmut is back. Oh, 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 and if Russian Railroads was enough, then the next year, he did Tramways, which is a phenomenal, um, great, wonderful card-based, uh, train game. Now, He's doing, he's back to trains, coming up with something new, first class, riding the Orient Express, um, where this time we're focused more on being passengers on the train, um, and while still building up the, uh, the, what do you call it, the, the networks and all of that. So, I don't know, I haven't read the rules. In all honesty, I'm a little bit nervous because this is from Hans and Gluck, and I think so far it hasn't been announced that there's going to be an English version of the game, so the rules might only be available in German. I might be taking a big risk to rate this so high because, heck, maybe I'm not even going to be able to play the thing. But I'm still excited about it anyway. Number 12, first class, Unterwegs im Orient Express. Then on to number 11, Solarius Mission from uh, Michael Keller and Andreas Odendahl, who made such a huge splash a couple of years ago with Lagranha. That was in my top ten. Was it my number two of the year? It came out. 
Maybe my number two, maybe my number three. One of the best games of the year. Still an absolutely stellar, phenomenal breakthrough design. These guys just came out of nowhere and took the world by storm. This is their big follow-up. And it is a, an epic space exploration colonization game. Um, that's all I need to know. I, again, I have not read the rules. I don't need to. I um, just am super duper stoked for this. Just, uh, but, oh, I, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, man, I just went so long, back and forth, back and forth. Should this have made my number ten or my number eleven? The the one that made the number ten just barely squeaked it out. This, I mean, this is an honorable dimension for number ten. I'm so excited about it, just based on how amazing Lagranha is. And so I can't wait to see what these guys have done with number eleven, Solarius Mission. And now, folks, we are at the hairy edge. But you know what? Um, I have noticed Jen has kind of been hovering. Um, and I think, yeah, you know what? I think, hold on a second. Hold on. We're going to be right back. And Jen is going to join us a little bit because she's been showing me something I think we should talk about. We'll be back. Jen will be joining us, and then we'll hit the top ten. So hang out, everybody. We'll Hold on. I'm, 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 I'm getting delirious here. Okay. We're here, folks. We're finally here. There were so many games to go through, but these are the tops, the must-haves, the ones I will not leave Germany without in my hot little hands. Fingers crossed. I mean, hopefully. But you know what? Before we get to that, I'm not going to Germany alone. Actually, let's bring in a special guest appearance by my lovely wife, Jen. Hi, honey pie. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, like I said, Jen's going to be at the show as well, and you will actually have a booth set up, right? I will have a table at the stand with NSKN Games. Mm -hmm. They have been very, very generous at giving me space. Yep, yep, yep. Lovely people. Lovely uh, people. Where are they? They are in Hall 1. G124. G124. Yep. Hall 1. So if you want to meet Jen, you're going to be there all four days. In the flesh. Right? Uh, yes. Except for the occasional bathroom break, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, selling your, your gamer glass, selling jewelry. Yep. And also taking entries for your yearly Essen-themed giveaway. Yes. All righty. Yes. And this year it is a lovely game called In the Name of Odin. Yep. And I've made some markers to go specifically with the game. They are runes, and they actually spell out the name Odin. And uh, they, there's a special one that also means Odin. The red one, actually, that rune means Odin. Yep. So these are your Odin runes, basically. Yep. Obviously, you can use them for keeping score in the name of Odin, or, well, really, any game. Um, and so, basically, if people seek you out at the show, yep. you'll have a sign-up form, and at the end of the show, one lucky winner will get a full copy of the name of Odin yep. and a custom handmade set of scoring markers in right. Gamer Glass. Yep, just like those. Right. So, and in addition, I'm going to do a, another drawing for my online people who have signed up right. on the website. Okay. So just go to jennifer.net and uh, give me your email address, and on probably Wednesday or Thursday after the show, we'll do another drawing. Yeah. J-E-N-E-F-E-R dot N-E-T. Yes. Sign up for her newsletter, basically, and yeah. you could potentially win this as well. Yeah. Thanks very much to NSKN for hosting Jen and yes. for also providing the games, although you'll still be providing the glass. Yep. And was there anything else about Essen you wanted to say? It's a nice partnership. Um, just one last little thing is that I was going to be offering T-shirts, Gamer Glass T-shirts, and also Rotter Runs Through Spiel 2016. <laughs> that would be 2016. Uh -huh. uh, T-shirts as well. But I need to know by the end of the day on Wednesday, which is two days from now, if you want those. So go to my website if you do and order them, right. and I'll have them for you at the show. By the 5th. By, uh, the, by the end of the day, Malta time, October 5th. October 5th. Uh, they have to have gone to your Etsy site to order if they want to pick those up at the show. Yes. And Because this is a limited time thing. After the show, you know, these these t-shirts, after that, they're coming off. Yep. Um, okay. So, so hold on, though. Totally forgot. Jen also wanted to mention that for the first 100 people who visit her every day at the show, she will have for them a little Rotto Runs Through sticker that you can stick on your phone, on your peachy, on your forehead, whatever it is you might want to stick a little icon of me on. Jen's got you covered. So be sure to swing by. First 100 folks every day gets one right. 
I think that's it. Thanks, that's it. Honey Pie. Thank you. Apologies to anybody. I think this is the first ever um, uh, commercial interruption of a Rado runs through. But now, folks, now let's get to those final, those all important top 10 games. Right. So, number 10. Where is my list? I have it right over here. Okay. Number 10 is The Colonists. And this one, I, I actually. Of all my top 10, this is, I think, the biggest punt, the biggest gamble, the biggest risk. It's from Lookout Mayfair. Uh, it's from a brand new designer. This is his first published design. What is his name? Um, Tim Oles. I've got written down there. And it's interesting. It's a, it's a worker placement game where you just have one worker and you don't actually place him on the board. He actually moves around from, say, space. All the worker placement spaces of the board are the board itself. The, it's a modular board. It snaps together. So all the different worker placement spaces create this area that your one worker, you, kind of your mayor, can navigate around moving from one space to the other. So it's not like a regular worker placement game where, oh, I can just choose any of these actions I want if they're not blocked. You have to plan out ahead. Right. In this turn, if I do this, that means next turn I could do this, this, or this. That's actually a really cool idea. And you've seen similar things to it, like maybe in an Istanbul or something like that. But I think this sounds actually very, very fresh. And the other thing about the game, too, is this is a, their big, heavy economic euro. They've always got one every year. This one also features a series of campaign scenarios. So you can kind of get, this is a rarity for um, Euro-style games, a sense of progression, this storyline that goes one after another after another Bye, honey pie. Um, yep. All righty. Uh, so that actually sounds really, really cool to me. My number 10, Colonists. And then we move on to the number 9, Golden Sails. This is from designer Yuri uh, Zurevlev who kind of burst onto the scene a few years ago with Viceroy, an absolutely phenomenal game, one of the best games of that year. And, you know, it's since gone on to get published in America, and a lot of people love it. It's a really, really great game. This is kind of his follow-up to that. It's set in his same fantasy universe. I think the name of the universe is Tempest or something like that. But anyway, so it's a, it's a fantasy setting. But at its heart, it's a very simple card drafting game where all the cards we're going for have multiple uses. You know, it could, you know, it could produce several different things. But for me to actually take the card, I just don't reach out onto the table and grab it. I have my own cards that represent experts in gems and travel or whatever. Whatever the different categories that all these cards provide. I have to admit, I don't know all the particulars, but I'm, I'm in love with this idea. I've got these experts. If I want to grab that particular card, because it's got a green gem and I want a green gem, well, I've got to play my gem expert to grab that card. That means I've just given up my gr gem expert. I can't grab any of those other gems anymore. For any of those other cards that are still out there, I have to use a different expert and grab them to have a different function. That is so cool. Such a fresh, interesting take on card drafting where, I mean, not only do you have to pick the cards you want, but the actual um, uh, ca characteristic of the given card. And once you've taken that characteristic, you can't take any other cards for that same characteristic until all your experts are done. Then you call them all back. It sounds absolutely brilliant. And Viceroy was phenomenal. And so I have very, very, very high hopes for the Golden Sails. That's my number nine. Now, on to number eight. Four Gods. I have been waiting for this one for years, it seems like. I, it seems like it was first announced a couple of years ago, and I've had it on my geek list of interests for quite a while now, and I'll tell you why. This is a real-time tile-laying game, a competitive one, uh, where we are each gods, all, you know, up to four players, up to four gods, each you know, competing to build the world as fast as they can, you know, by laying tiles out and, you know, having to make sure all the tiles line up appropriately, kind of Carcassonne style. So you might say, well, that kind of sounds like maybe a galaxy trucker. Everybody's racing to build their own truck. Oh, we're just all racing to build the same, our, our, our world and have the best world, right? Uh-uh. So here's the thing. We're all racing in real time, tile laying, to build the same world. We're all putting tiles into the same common world. So, uh, you know, as I've got this tile in my hand, and it's got ocean on one side and, and continent on the other, and I'm trying to find the perfect place to put it. If I'm paying attention to you, oh, look there. Over on the western side of the, of the map, you put down a space that makes gives me an opportunity to put my tile down. And you have to be careful about that. You have to be constantly thinking and paying attention, not only because you're not, unlike Galaxy, not in your own little world, just focusing on your own little thing. You are focusing on a communal world that we, as four gods, all control and all build simultaneously. Mind blown. I am so excited about this, and I have been forever. It's from uh, Chris Bullier. 
or B- Bollier, uh, who did Archipelago, who's done Dungeon Twister. He is a really outside the box designer. And I mean, I've been waiting for this for a long time. I cannot wait. Oh, I'm almost there. Number eight is Four Gods. Should have actually done that so it would have been my number four. That would have been smart, but I've never been accused of being smart. Let's move on to number seven. Gluk Alf. Das Grosche Kartenspiel, or Cole Baron, the big card game. Um, I've already done a run-through for Cole Baron, or Gluk Alf. I mean, you can go uh, ch- check that out. It's a wonderful worker placing game. Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And it's from my favorite um, board game design duo, Kramer and Kiesling. They are now gotten together. They're revisiting the ideas. And uh, according to the description on Board Game Geek, this promises to have the spirit of Gluk Alf, or Cole Baron, but uh, what's it say? Uh, very distinct, new gameplay, and yet just as intense. That sounds good to me. But, you know, whenever you say Kramer and Kiesling get together, I'm going to be there with bells on. And so I'm really excited about this because I think this is the first time where they've ever decided to revisit a design and come up with new interesting ideas. So what does that mean? Over the years, they, they oh, we're not done with Luke Alf. We've got to go back. We've got to revisit it. Let's not do an expansion. Let's do a whole new thing that gets us explore this space in new ways. Why isn't everybody as excited as me for our number seven, Glukauf, Das Groten Kartenspiel? Number six is going to be Order of the Gilded Compass. And I'm super stoked for this because I have been the biggest fan of Aaliyah E. Octa S. Forever. A wonderful, wonderful dice worker placement game long before they were cool and hip um, from Bern Eisenstein and Jeffrey Allers. I've done a run through for it. I've been raving about it for years. But... It's been out of print for years. It's been very, very difficult to find. And uh, finally, it's been reprinted. It's been completely rethemed. It's no longer set in ancient Greece. I guess it's set in kind of a uh, Indiana Jones world-hopping artifact-collecting kind of scenario. Honestly, I don't really care. All I care about is that great, wonderful gameplay with new ideas. Once again, this is an example of designers revisiting their baby, coming up with new and interesting ways. Because, you know... In the years since, they've designed other games. They've gotten better. So this could only be an improvement, right? We'll find out as soon as I get my hands on number six, Order of the Gilded Compass. Number five is... Railroad Revolution. I've talked about them before. I'm going to talk about them again. The Zanguo Design Super super Team of uh, Marco uh, Canetta and uh, Stefania Nicolini. Um... Not as well known, perhaps, as your Stefan Felds or your Uwe Rosenbergs or your Eric Langs or whatnot, but these two are just crackerjack designers. Uh, the Doe Ship was a phenomenal game. Zanguo was absolutely amazing, as I've already talked about. Um, and now they are getting together, teaming up once more with What's Your Game to bring out r- uh, Railroad Revolution. Um, so, What's it about? Well, I, I guess it's a worker placement game. And the most interesting thing about it is that you, you have generic workers, uh, you know, just who will do with the action of whatever you place as you're trying to build your rail network across the continental U.S., I guess, from the uh, screenshot of the board we've seen so far. But you can take the option to promote your workers and give them specialist roles. Now, I've seen that in a bunch of games, um, so that's not exactly new. But uh, knowing Marco and Stefiana or uh, Stefania, I expect really great things because, you know, what's your game? They're, they're one of the best board game publishers out there. They're easily one of my favorites. They'd be in my, my top five board game publishers of all time. They've got good instincts. Uh, Stefania and Marco have got good design shops. Zanguo was phenomenal. That's why I'm super duper stoked for number five, Railroad Revolution. And then moving on to number four, The Great Western Trail. From Alexander Pfister. I mean, this guy, this Alexander Pfister guy, I don't know how many towards I'm going to talk about just how he's amazing. Uh, just over the last few years, he's had some Spiel des Jahres, Kenner Spiel des Jahres wins. He's, um, you know, working with a lot of other designers and putting some lot of great stuff. This is a big magnum opus for him, uh, working all by himself this time. And it's uh, basically a big, heavy, sprawling Euro, economic simulation Euro, set in the American West. That in and of itself is intriguing and exciting to me. Normally, American West games are like, you know, big old shoot 'em up in your face stuff or, um, you know, kind of light party fare. It's rare to find something that's really meaty, like, uh, like, uh, say Carson City. So, uh, Great Western Trail, you are cowboys trying to run your, uh, you know, your cattle into, uh, you know, your cattle herd to make it through. 
Uh, and uh, you're as focusing as much on your herd as you are on your team of cowboys who have to be taken care of you know, when we're out on the trail trying to uh, to make it. That's all I know. That's all I need to know. I'm super duper stoked. I mean, Alexander Fister has just rocketed um, to the top of my must watch every one of his games, even the ones I didn't like because maybe they were a little too mean, like broom or something. I've been impressed by just how smart and clever they are. That's what I expect from number four, the Great Western Trail. And then moving on to number three, Le Grand Ha, the dice game. No siesta. Now, I did a run-through for Le Grand Hall when it first came out a couple of years ago, and I said this is one of the best games of the year. I think it was maybe my number two game of that year. I'd have to go back and check. Um, number two or number three. So amazing. Um, from from uh, these guys who just kind of came out of nowhere um, and you know made this amazing hodgepodge Euro design that feels like the best of, of what Stefan Feld could offer. And I say that as high praise because Stefan Feld is, as always, my absolute favorite board game designer of all time. The Grand Hall was absolutely amazing. It did so many things well. And one of the things that it did right in the middle of the game, in the middle of every round, you had this very palpable, tension-filled uh, dice draft. It worked really, really nicely. And so what have they done? They've taken that dice draft out of the full game with a million different things and built a whole game around that that still captures all the thematic beats of the full game and just becomes a smaller, quicker, easier, more digestible package. I love it. I love dice drafting. I recently declared that my number one favorite gameplay mechanism of all time. These guys have made one of the best dice drafters ever um, thus far. And now, but there it was just one small piece of a, of a big mosaic of gameplay. Here, it's the sole focus. So I'm even more excited. Cannot wait to try the Grand Ha, uh, the dice game No Siesta. And then we move on to number two, Key to the City. London. From um, Richard Rees and Sebastian Bleasdale, uh, those guys, when they got together before, they gave us a uh, key flower, which is still in my top 10 favorite games of all time. Phenomenal game. Every expansion that's come out for that has just improved the game. It's just gotten better and better and better. An amazing auction game. Works well with two. Does so much right stuff. And so now, uh, this... Uh, what was Actually... Quite a few uh, design pairs here. I just I didn't even realize that till now. So these uh, designers have gotten together again. They're revisiting the ideas of Key Flower, but transposing them out of you know a, a presumed new American world and basically uh, putting them in London as players watch London build up before them. I don't know what's new or different. Obviously, the the art's different, the setting is different. I don't know if the gameplay is exactly the same or if they've come up with new stuff. I don't care. This is a buy sight unseen. Uh, I mean, these you know, uh, you know, Richard, you know, the, the, both these guys have really proven themselves. Keyflower, one of the best games of all time, as far as I'm personally concerned, in my own opinion. So of course, it's no brainer. Must get Key to the City London. And finally, folks, the number one, and you know, it really should come as no surprise. Particularly, actually, I was just saying a little bit ago, number one. The Oracle of Delphi from designer Stefan Feld, my favorite designer of all time. Yay! Stefan Feld is back with a big game. You know, he, uh, a few years ago, he had this big run of a ton of really awesome, amazing games. Then he kind of went quiet for a while. Uh, a little while ago, the, earlier this year, he gave us Castles of Burgundy, the card game, which was phenomenal. Absolutely love it. But I'm looking forward to something new and different from him because that's what I probably admire most about Stefan Feld more than anything else. He's always coming up with something new. He's always reinventing wheels. Um, um, you know, bravely adopting new gameplay mechanisms. And my understanding is the same is true here. This is not a Steffenfeld point salad like a lot of people might assume it's going to be. Apparently, this is a race game um, where you are zipping as fast as you can to, uh, you know, call upon the favor of the ancient Greek gods and, you know, sail all around the Aegean. So it sounds like it's a bit more Ameritrashy. I'm sure it's not. I'm, you know, but it, it's, it's certainly... It certainly sounds like his most thematic game to date, and I, I don't know that for a fact. Again, like uh, some of the previous ones, I haven't even bothered looking at the rules. I don't want to look at the rules. I don't want to have it spoiled for me. I am just super-duper excited to finally get this in my hands, start playing it with Jen, and I fully expect to fall in love with Feld all over again. High praise, um, big pressure, but you know I've been wanting a bigger, um, meatier, New Feld game for a while. And, you know, I've been getting them from other designers, other developers. I've talked about them, but there ain't no Feld but Feld, and he's back, baby, with my number one, 
Oracle of Delphi. And that's it, folks. The top 10, the creme de la creme, the ones, I know that there were so many more. Um, and I'm just going to say, uh, there's plenty more to come. Okay, everybody. So got the games out of the way. Now let's talk about expansions, which, you know, by their very nature, it's not going to be quite as interesting to talk about, uh, because often there's not quite as much known. They, you know, these things are all just going to take the base game that in theory you already love and add more content. Maybe a few new features here or there, what have you. So I actually didn't spend quite as much time doing research and I didn't spend any time actually trying to prioritize these or number them. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about these, what is it? 18 expansions just in alphabetical order. I know a little bit about some of them, but not too terribly much. So in theory, we're just going to get through this pretty quick, but it's still important because once again, the voters are going to decide which of these expansions they want to be sure I pick up so that they will see covered. So let's jump right into it. And it starts out with Adventureland. Or no, I'm sorry. It's in German. It's Auf Deutsch. Abenturland, König und Prinzessin. Or Adventureland, King and Princess. And so this adds, I guess, three new gameplay modules to Adventureland. Three new ways to play the game um, called Princess Abduction, Liberation of the King, and Super Fog Monsters. <laughs> and what more do you need to know? I mean, that's just, I mean, Adventureland was absolutely a wonderfully phenomenal little game. Although it's interesting, the three base ways, the three adventure modules that come with the base game, aren't different enough to make us say, oh, wow, this is so radically different than the other one. We pretty much just play the area control one. So it would be nice to actually have some pretty significantly different changes. I don't know if Super Fog Monsters is going to change stuff. I saw a picture that just looked like tougher monsters. But, you know, having to save the king or the princess, maybe they'll work different ways. Who knows? But kind of a must-have, right? Uh, because the base game is so great. Next up, we've got Aeon's Ends, the depths. And actually, it's interesting, I don't actually have Aeon's End yet. Um, I've only done a run-through for the Kickstarter campaign, but Jen, I really enjoyed that one quite a bit. Jen enjoyed it so much that she actually requested to do a live playthrough of it. And so, it's a fantasy cooperative deck builder. So, what are you going to get in an expansion? Lots more cards, new mages, a new enemy, lots of new spells and whatnot. It's pretty much what you would expect, and the base game is already so great. I, I expect more greatness from Aeons and the Depths. Then we've got Alchemist, King's Golem. Now, this is a bigger one. This is not just, hey, let's just throw in some new stuff. This is like a bunch of new ways to play. I guess it has four different modules you can turn on or off as you like. Uh, the simplest one is just a uh, an extra setup step you can do so that everybody starts with different resources. That's nice, unique starting setups. Cool. Uh, a reward system for when you finish orders, when you actually deliver potions and whatnot. You can get extra benefits, but there's extra challenges to completing the orders, whatever that means. This is a bigger one, a new, a completely different way to publish your research, basically into the Encyclopedia Magica or something like that. Don't know how it works, but you know, obviously publishing research is already such a major part of the game. It'll be interesting to see how they change it up. But the biggest thing is this communal project that all players can be working on trying to reanimate a golem. And I don't know what that means. I haven't actually read the rules. But according to the little description on Board Game Geek, what it does is it adds an entirely new line of deduction to the game. And of course, that's what the whole game is already, is deducing what all the alchemical components are. And now you've got a whole bunch of additional deduction on top of that. So how does that work? How does it work with the app? I don't know. But this sounds like a pretty big, ambitious one. Alchemist King Gollum. Then we've got Ancient Terrible Things, The Lost Chapter, um, which has actually been available for a while, but I guess this is just going to be its release in Europe. It's got you know new dice, new cards, new achievements to do. Probably the most interesting thing about it was the original Ancient Terrible Thing comes in a standard Stone Age size box. The uh, expansion is very, very proud of the fact that uh, the expansion uh, box is a travel box. So you can apparently fit the entire base game and all the expansion content in this new travel box, which doubles as a portable dice tray. I haven't actually tried that, but I really like the idea of it. I'm always looking for ways to reduce the, the size of boxes on my shelves, so just a smaller box is enough reason to seek that out as far as I'm concerned. 
That's it for A's. Now we're on to the C's with clinic medical dossier number three. There's already two other medical dossiers. I've got both of them, although I haven't actually done any run-throughs for them. But now there's a third one coming out that adds a bunch of new tiles to add to your hospitals and new concepts like pregnant ladies who come to your clinic for service and also viruses that spread through. That's not a nice combination. Hopefully keep the viruses away from the nice pregnant ladies. Then uh, we've got Istanbul Brief und Siegel, which is German for letters and seals. Interestingly, this, I guess, is going to be the last expansion ever for Istanbul, which, in case you forgot, is a hugely popular Kennerspiel des Jahres winner. And, uh, you know, the previous one, uh, Mocha and Bakshish, was a really big, very, very impactful, added a bunch of new stuff to the game. So does this one. Uh, the letters and seals, which would be the main thing, I guess, is basically you can pick up letters that, you know, once you have these, this becomes an additional objective. In addition to just running all over the marketplace, trying to get the resources you need to convert into gems, uh, you know, the pick up and deliver of the base game, now you can get these letters, and if you travel, and it's kept in secret, you, nobody knows where you're trying to go, but if you go to specific places that the letters need to take you to, and that means you might go out of your way to places you wouldn't normally go, you actually you collect seals, and these seals give you new powers. Like one of them, if you have three seals, you can get like a whole bonus turn and stuff. So that just accentuates the what the core game is, which is a, a trying to get maximum efficiency of your travel. There's other stuff in it too, like companions, which becomes like a second guy. It's, it's not like your assistants who you just leave littered all over the marketplace and then go pick them back up. This is another character who's a, basically a second merchant. And you put him out somewhere on the board, and when you move him, he can only move one space. He's like your main merchant without any assistance. But that means you could have your main merchant on one side of the board and this companion on the other side of the board. So you can split up and get a lot more efficient as well. And I was, I think there's like, uh, I'm trying to remember now, there was, oh, catacombs, so you can like have shortcuts from one side to the other. So basically just a bunch of cool stuff. But what's more interesting to me, it's the last one. At least that's what they've announced. Um, so that's something to take into account. Next up, we have Mysterium Hidden Signs, which is basically just a whole bunch of new cards. New suspects, new locations, new wep murder weapons, and new dream cards. And I gotta say, you know, the art form all looks really great. Um, it's a little disappointing, I guess. Actually, I'm not 100% certain if the, I, I'm not, well, I know the, the main one that's announced is for the new reprint that had a whole bunch of new art. I don't know if there's another version of Mysterium Hidden Sides that has art that's compatible with the old Time Ichi de Mostwo versions. I'm not really quite sure about that. But one thing that was really interesting is this expansion is just new cards. And, the odd thing is, for the older, for the Ukrainian and Polish versions of Mysterium, there's a bunch of other little promos that have been added that like add new features and functions to the game, like, like give the ghost player new things they can do, but none of that stuff was put in Hidden Signs, which is a little disappointing, I'll be honest. I would have hoped that those things would have made it in, but apparently they're only available separately, or maybe they'll be available as promos, I'm not sure. But Hidden Signs, my understanding is, it's just new card art. Now, don't get me wrong. That's a huge deal right there. This is a game like Dixit that absolutely demands more card art to keep the game fresh. You can keep playing and, you know, have new, um, new ways to puzzle out connections between the different cards. So anyway, uh, so if you have Mysterium, it's kind of a no-brainer to pick up Mysterium Hidden Signs. Then you've got Mystic Veil. Veil of Magic. Honestly, if there was only one expansion I was picking up in this entire All of Essence Spiel, or Spiel of Taga, it would be Mystic Veil, Veil of Magic, because Mystic Veil, you know, I mentioned this in my run-through for it, it's kind of like a deck builder like Dominion that only came with about half the cards it should have. So we need this expansion to make sure just the base game of Mystic Veil has legs. Um, you know, and it's a bunch. It's, it's got a whole bunch. I guess it's like 72 new cards. That's a lot. That should really flesh it out and make sure the base game has legs. Particularly because there's a lot of really cool new, you know, um, events and features these cards offer. So it's an absolute must have. If you like Mystic Veil, you absolutely have to get this to make Mystic Veil, kind of a complete product. Then uh, we've got Networks on the Air, which I think adds around 30 new cards, you know, new actors, new shows, new ads. It's just one of those, hey, it doesn't really fundamentally rock the boat, just gives you more content. I guess this was all the content that was unlocked as stretch goals in the Kickstarter campaign, um, and so now they're all boxed up in one handy little expansion, Networks on the Air. 
And then, ooh, this is another one. I guess this might be the second biggest deal. Well, this is certainly the, probably the one that's most exciting to me in terms of what it's doing. Oh my goods, Longsdale, uh, Longsdale in Aufruhr, which means riots in Longsdale. So, Oh My Goods was a really simple little push your luck engine building, you know, convert resources into points kind of game. Um, simple little card game. We've done a run through for it. Let's see. But the interesting thing here is this expansion adds kind of a, a, a narrative campaign to that simple little economic engine building game. Now there are five chapters and you play them through five separate sessions and it tells a story of the riots of Longsdale. Um, you know, as, uh, you know, as you keep on trying to do the base portion of the game, but as you go from, you know, uh, session, from chapter to chapter to chapter, the core rules of the game change to reflect the changing, um, events in the city. That is so cool. Why haven't we seen that more in Euro games? You know, this, this notion of, I mean, you, you see campaign style play in Ameritrash games all the time. How awesome is that to see it in, in a, in a Euro style game? I mean, even a simple little light push your luck game like this. This is so cool. I'm so in love with this. I hope this idea catches on. I want to see campaign based gameplay in Agricola where every mission for every time you play, you know, um, the, the, the situation keeps building and growing. That's so awesome. Oh my goods. Uh, Longsdale in our, in Alfur. I hope this is a signal of things to come. I'm really excited about it. After that, we've got Orleans. Uh, handle un intrigue, which is basically, well, this is interesting. I mean, Orleon out of the box is great. And, uh, you know, for, for it to have legs for me and Jen, really, we had to come up with our own little player variant. I talked about that in the original run through. And the thing I've always wanted for more of Orleans, just more buildings. That's all I want. Just more buildings for more flexibility, more variety. It's like, you know, in Dominion. What do you want? You want more kingdom cards so you can get more variety every time you play, uh, you know, um, but, but they keep not doing that. Um, because in Handel and Intrigue, I think they add only three new buildings and instead they add these radically new systems. Just like Orleans Invasion added all this new stuff, but hardly any new buildings. They're doing the same thing with Handel and Intrigue. So, I mean, yeah, you get three new buildings. That's cool. But what else do you get? Well, you get contracts, which is the notion that now... You, um, you know, the, the resources you pick up, you actually have a reason to travel with the traveling merchant to different cities to deliver them. They've added a pick up and deliver mechanism, basically, if you want to play with that. Um, they've added a completely different deeds board. You know, the, the main deeds where you're like building a sewer system or whatever, um, you know, which is in the base game, you can leave that one out and come up with a completely different one that has radically different game changing effects depending on those. It really kind of soups up that core thing, which was always a small part of the game. But now it's like potentially a major part of the game. But this is really interesting. Well, not interesting for me and Jen. We wouldn't use it. But you can you can change the old deeds board with this new deeds board, or you can place the old deeds board with the intrigue board, where you can send workers off to the intrigue board, not to give yourself extra benefits and whatnot, but to mess over your opponent and slow them down, slow their progress. So they've added this whole new way to attack players. They've made the game, quote, interactive, which I'm sure for a lot of players is a really big deal. It's not something Jen and I want, just like in the Orleans Invasion. There was a bunch of stuff in there we didn't want. But, um, oh, and then a whole bunch, I think it's like 30 new event tiles that completely replace the events of the base game and add really big, big punishing game-changing events. So it really kind of soups up that portion of the game as well. So this is all a bunch of cool stuff, although I'm, I'm not really keen on the intrigue stuff. I'm sure a lot of people who are. Man, they still aren't just giving us more buildings. Well, I don't know. Uh, slowly but surely we're getting more buildings through the promos they release and just a few in here, but I, I still, I'm hoping the next Orleans um, is just a bunch of new buildings. That's all I want. Okay, after that. We've got Pandemic the Cure Experimental Meds, which is neat. I don't think anybody was particularly expecting this, but it's really, really great. They're continuing to support the game. It adds a fifth virus, always very important. And apparently the concept of hot zones, which I assume um, basically 
if a given region becomes hot, that adds new game-breaking rules to the game and uh, like suddenly changes all the rules. You know, and we've seen similar stuff like that added to regular Pandemic. I, I'm really excited to see new cool changes to Pandemic: The Cure. I mean, that's really really great. The kind of coming out of nowhere, but definitely um, a big boon for fans of that. And uh, after that, we've got Pelopony's card game, Patronus, which. It's very, very cool. I'm very excited about this. Well, actually, again, some stuff I'm excited, some stuff I'm not. They add the resources so you can add another player to the game. That's great. Uh, that, was, that was an important step for the evolution of regular Pelepenes. Again, something Jen and I don't need, but it's great that it's there. They've also added an additional round so it can go one round longer and so you can have kind of an epic length game. That was a big deal for Pelepenes, so it's great they're bringing it into the card game. And then the other thing I, mean, I think a lot of people will really find important is the concept of introducing Patronus. Which uh, it's no, it's not Harry Potter stuff necessarily. It's kind of the same though. It's ba- I don't know what it is exactly, but for people who complain that the that the uh, what do you call it the the catastrophes are too punishing and too unpredictable. I don't know. I don't. We really feel that way. We we feel the game actually has a you know have a good level of ways to protect yourself and to recover from disasters. But if you found the disaster to be too punishing, Patronus is what you're looking for. These become additional ways that you can protect yourself from the disasters. So that's all really cool. Mike, what I'm really curious about is is this the wave of the future? Um, is it going to be Pelopony's card game expansions now? Pelopony's has gotten all the expansions it's ever going to get, and now we're seeing those types of expansions and other stuff moving over to Pelopony's the card game. Does that mean Pelopony's the card game will someday re- replace Pelopony's? I don't know. Moving on, though, we've got Port Royal Unterwegs, which is interesting. Um, I-, I guess the Port Royal... Um Oh, what was it called? Uh, actually, I just did a run through for it the other day. Oh, the the cooperative uh, Erweiterung, uh, the the cooperative last solo play that hasn't been released outside of Germany. I was surprised. I didn't realize that, even though it's been around for a year. And now they're releasing a new one. I guess this one's also only going to be available in German, although they're language independent um, or only available in Germany. It hadn't gone wide release, but. The last one was a really big deal. Added like radically new stuff to the game, you know, with the contracts. Added cooperative play, which is really, really awesome. Added solo play for people who are looking for that too. That's all nice. This one isn't quite as ambitious. It looks like it's just, well, it's interesting. It's a standalone game. And in fact, actually, the description says it's a stripped down standalone game. And I don't know what that means because Port Royal is pretty stripped down to begin with. It, you can't get much simpler as a, just a fast, fun, little push your luck, uh, you know, resource gathering game. Or not exactly resource. Yeah, well, po- point, victory point gathering game. And so they've got the, it's a stripped down standalone version, but the new cards are characters you can add to the original version as well. So it still counts as an expansion, but it's also a standalone. So that's cool. I mean, Port Royal is really, really awesome. So more stuff is, is good as far as I'm concerned. Then we've got Russian Railroads, American Railroads, which I think is going to be a bit of a disappointment for folks. Because if you're thinking this is going to be like German Railroads last year, which was a really big expansion and added, it was a huge overhaul to the game. Really changed things up. Added a lot of legs to the game, you know, with modular boards and all kinds of stuff. This is not that. Russian Railroads, American Railroads, is a mini expansion. Which a lot of people don't remember. They actually did a previous mini expansion that basically just added some new engineers and some new trains and stuff like that. So Russian Railroads, American Railroads is another one of the mini expansions, which is likely just going to be a single punch board of new features that just get added into the base game. Don't get me wrong. Still worth having more engineers, which is the you know the crux of that game and what adds the replay value is always going to be great, but not a big one, just a little mini expansion, Russian Railroads, American Railroads. Then we've got Simurg Call of the Dragon Lord. Which looks like another big one that, you know, changes a lot of stuff. Adds a bunch of new things. Adds an entirely new board. Another lost ancient city with a whole bunch of new worker placement options. A whole new type of worker you can, um, use. The wizard, who I, I guess uses, uh, the resources in completely different ways to cast spells and whatnot. Also, a system so everybody can have unique, obje- um, starting Abilities and special powers, that's always great. And new quests, quest objectives that you can be pursuing while you're doing all the regular exploration you do. And then a whole bunch of new landscapes to explore also. So on the whole, sounds like a lot of really cool stuff for a very, very neat and unique worker placement game. Then we've got Small City Big Tiles. 
This is the first expansion for Small City, and it's basically just 54 new tiles with a whole bunch of new types of buildings that add some radically different game-changing functions to the game, like mansions for rich people, airports, all kinds of stuff that really... Oh, um, leisure centers you can spread all around your city. A lot of really cool, big new tiles. And then the last one... This one I don't really have much to say about. It's um, Tashket Erweiterung, which is, you know, Tashket, the expansion. Tashket's an odd little game. It came out several years ago. Very small print run. Um, very few people have it. We actually have it. And I've had it now for four years, and I've always wanted to go back and play it, but the the uh, voters never quite give it the love. It, it needs more thumbs. Go to thumbs.rado.com. Thumb all the games you want to see me run through. Someday, Tashket, hopefully, will work its way up in the thumbs so that it'll actually get a run through. But, you know, Jenna, we've had it all these years. I always want to go back to it, and we never get to because it never gets the thumbs. Now, completely out of left field, the publisher is is um, putting out an expansion. And it looks like a pretty substantial expansion. It adds a bunch of new features to the game. That's crazy. I mean, I, it's great. Um, my, my only hope is that this actually g engenders more enthusiasm and excitement for the game so it'll get more thumbs so I can actually do a run-through of it because I've been wanting to do it for quite a while. It's one of those games that just always sits on my shelf just wanting to get played but never quite makes it. Come on, Tashcat, You can do it. And that's it, folks. Those are the expansions of interest, from my perspective anyway, to be sought out at Essen. And of course, like the games we just talked about, these are all going to go on the list of things that the uh, high-level voters get to choose. What am I going to pick up? So folks, you know what I think. Vote wisely. And now, hold on. We'll be right back. I think I need to get another cough drop. My throat. Ooh. Um, but next up, we'll be doing a very, very quick list. Hold on. Okay, folks. So this should be quick, this should be painless, this should be pretty easy. I am now going to just do a quick listing of the 36 games debuting at Essen, according to Eric Martin's list, that I've already done run-throughs for. And so you can go check out the run-through, or, or in, in, a, in like one or two cases, kind of done run-throughs for. So you can go check out the run-through, see what the game looks like. You know, Often it'll be you know from a Kickstarter prototype, but still you have a good idea of whether... You can decide for yourself whether you should buy it, um, but don't worry. I mean, these are not going to go on the voting list for people to buy because I've already done run-throughs for them, so I don't need the final version of the game. So I'm just going to remind you what they are. Just a quick sentence or two. This will be an interesting test for me. Can I be succinct? Can I be to the point? Well, already I failed at that, but let's see if I can um, pump up the jam. And this will just be in alphabetical order. So what do we got here? We've got... Aeon's End. Very cool little cooperative deck builder. I already mentioned earlier in the show, we really enjoyed this one a lot. Rocketed to the top of our favorite cooperative deck builder fantasy games. Um, lovely, lovely title. Alchemidius. Actually, oh, I haven't done the run-through for this yet, but I will have this run-through done in time for Essen. So you might have, you might be hearing this before you see the run-through of it. But suffice to say, neat, clever, Real-time competitive alchemical equation generation game, um, which is really kind of offbeat, but it it delivers on that. And Jen, I enjoy it quite a bit, and I especially appreciate it because it forces me to address a real shortcoming I have, which is doing math in my head. And this game, you know, it'd be great for classrooms. Just a really neat, clever game all around. Anachrony. Very, very cool worker placement game set in a far-flung post-apocalypse future uh, where mankind is trying to save itself from impending disaster. How? Through the invention and proper manipulation of time travel. This is a really clever game where you are needing resources to, um, you know, Build the buildings and all the stuff you need to do. How do you get those resources? By sending yourself those resources from the future after you invent time travel. So once those resources show up, you've got a date with destiny. You better make sure in the future that you actually send those things back to yourself or there will be a rip in the space-time continuum, and that ain't good. Really, really clever game. Uh, really, really great worker placement and awesome miniatures. Neat, neat game, Anachrony. 
At, uh, next up, oh, this is a classic. At the Gates of Low Yang. I was talking earlier about how modern Uwe Rosenberg doesn't really quite float our boat as much as he used to, but Gates of Low Yang, one of his best games ever. Finally, after years of being out of print, it's getting a wonderful reprint. Phenomenal um, simulation of running a farmer's stall at a market at the Gates of Low Yang, growing crops and then selling those crops at the market to customers. And the most interesting thing about the game is these customers become repeat customers. So you have to set up your, you know, your engine of growing crops to be able to sell, not only just do one-time sales, but to be able to keep selling as your repeating customers come back over and over again. Plus, it has a very, very clever, very unique card draft I haven't really seen anywhere else. Neat game, lovely, at the gates of Luoyang. Ave Roma. This is another neat game, a worker placement set in ancient Rome. The most interesting thing about it is the workers do not belong to individual players. Uh, instead, there's this very kind of cool worker draft you do, where after all the workers have been placed out, they're all the same color, and players take turns reclaiming all the workers based on what actions they actually did. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's really fresh, really unique, a kind of brush of fresh, uh, brush of breath of fresh air kind of a game. Plus, the board is round. That's always awesome. I always like to see more round boards. Really liked it a lot. That is Ave Roma. Next up, we have Clank. Very, very cool deck builder. Kind of uh, one of the vanguard, these new deck builders that gives you an avatar who moves around in the world based on the strength of your deck. Sharp, funny, very clever game. And the big thing you got to worry about is not filling up your deck with too many loud cards because the more noise you make as you're exploring around in this dungeon by doing deck building, the more likely the dragon's going to come for you. Fun game. Neat, clever deck builder. Clank with an exclamation point. Then we've got Colony, which is, well, it's not really, it feels like a deck builder, but it's actually a dice rolling game. Every round, you're rolling tons and tons of dice to gather resources in a post-apocalypse future to build up the best human colony, because we're all trying to survive in this post-apocalypse. It's after the nanopocalypse, whatever that means. And so, we are trying to build up our, you know, our uh, supplies, our fallout shelters, all this kind of stuff. And it's all done through rolling dice, building up big, big collections of dice, having huge rolls, doing luck mitigation. And instead of building a deck, you're building a colony, which is a whole bunch of different buildings you can activate with the dice that you roll every round. Really neat. From Bezier Games, we really enjoyed it a lot. That's Colony. Next up, we've got Commissioner Victor, which is a... Cute little, I guess, would you call it deduction? No. It kind of defies description. It's hard to actually... It, it does not have a genre. What you're doing in the game is investigating the theft of a uh, priceless work of art. And what we're doing is we're, we um, have a whole bunch of mugshots of all the different people who might have been the uh, culprit. And we're playing these mugshots out to a 5x5 five five grid. And at the end of the game, once the 5x5 five five grid has been created, we're all adding um, individual characters, these, uh, these mugshots, to the same grid. Once the grid is over, that becomes the scoring mechanism. Because at the end of the game, I will have one mugshot left in my hand. That is the person I say is the culprit. And what happens is, and my mugshot might have glasses and a goatee. Every um, character, every face on this 5x5 five five grid of mugshots... Um, every row or column that is full of at least three glasses scores me points. So I am building my point scoring engine throughout the course of the game, but other players are building in the same, and they're messing up my scored po point scoring opportunities. So if I start seeing like a lot of handlebar mustaches appearing, that probably means one of my opponents wants to get a row or column full of handlebar mustaches. And then I've got a decision. Do I try to mess that up? Or do I switch and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go for a suspect who has handlebar mustache as well. So you have to figure out what your opponents are doing. You're trying to build your own end goal. And it's a very clever, very fast-playing game. It was a bit too mean and in-your-face for me and Jen because you're constantly trying to thwart your opponent. But again, really kind of far out. Plus, it has a little bonus game comes with it where you can just play Mastermind, but um, with these neat little mugshot cards. Then we've got... Crisis. This was a really neat worker placement game that basically is set in kind of a Blade Runner future city, but it's actually 
inspired by the financial crisis in Greece. It was actually from Greek designers, and um, we are in this game cast in the role of entrepreneurs trying to um, take advantage of the economic freefall of the city to um, you know create new industries, revive failed industries, provide um, you know economic recovery. And every step of the way while we're trying to do this, we have incentives from the government who are under extreme austerity measures um, that are imposed from the outside world. And the thing is, while players are trying to compete to be the best, most successful entrepreneur, we all have to do well to a certain extent because if the entire economy collapses, everybody loses. So it's this kind of interesting semi-cooperative game that, again, is torn right from the headlines, but then almost kind of Star Trek style, given this future science fiction setting so it can address and examine real world problems of today. It was a very, very solid worker placement game as well. Although again, one that is very interactive. It is designed to be uh, players trying to cut each other off at the pass and slit each other's throat and um, you'll get there one step ahead and really ruin your opponent. So it was too mean for me and Jen, but a neat, neat, clever game. Then we've got Dale of Merchants 2, which is a wonderful little um, deck building game. It's kind of flying under the radar. It's really, really cool because you're trying to build up your deck to um, be the best merchant in the Dale. But you're also trying to rip your tech apart by actually building your merchant stalls. You want to add cards to your deck to get more powers, but you need to remove those cards from your deck to actually set up your merchant stalls and score points. Very, very clever. Wonderful, cute, charming, anthropomorphized, cartoony Animals with a lot of different special powers. Neat. Really like it a lot. And Dale of Merchants 2 is a standalone game, but it um, also functions as an expansion for Dale of Merchants. Then we've got Days of Ire, which is really interesting. It was billed, correctly, as Twilight Struggle meets Pandemic. It's set in the um, real-world Russian occupation of that happened back in the 50s of... Um, oh, gosh. Was it Ukraine? No, Hungary. It was Hungary. Uh, the Russian occupation of Hungary uh, back in the 50s. And, or was it 60s? Oh, I don't remember now. But it's all based on historical real-world events. And the core gameplay is very much like Twilight Struggle, where one player plays as the Russians, trying to you know maintain an iron grip over the city, and the other player or players act as the rebellion trying to fight them off. And the thing is... The Russian player is basically playing a game that is very, very similar to Twilight Struggle. Playing cards, trying to use action points to uh, keep the rebellion under control. The Re rebel players are basically playing something very similar to Pandemic. They are running around the city, fighting hot spots of, of Russian intervention, and um, you know, collecting resources, um, you know, inspiring the troops. And trying to stay one step ahead. And uh, so you've got this really cool asymmetric game. And it's interesting. If you want, you can play it solo. So if you wanted, if you ever want to play Twilight Struggle as a solo game, get Days of Ire. And um, you can also play it as a purely cooperative game because it comes with rules that um, automates the Russian player's role so all the players can just be the resistance trying to fight them off. Really clever game. I liked it a lot. The only problem is Jen did not like the very, very gritty, authentic, historically accurate real-world setting because she doesn't like running around with guns shooting at people. But otherwise, brilliant game. Um, really clever. The whole asymmetrical thing, big watershed game. Next up, we've got Dungeon of Fortune, which is a neat, fast-playing little push-your-luck uh, card game where everybody's trying their best to um, make it as deep into a dungeon as possible, pushing the luck going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, we liked it, but really it wants to have at least three players. Two players, it was only so-so. It was better with more players, so it wasn't a keeper for us, but neat game. Then we've got Fantasy, uh, Hordes and Heroes, which at, I don't think... The run-through for this will be coming soon. Sorry, folks, if it isn't up yet. Neat game. Every round, you're rolling a bunch of dice to activate the members of your adventuring party to protect the town from the, on, the never-ending onslaught of big, bad monsters who are attacking. Um, actually, kind of similar to Colony. I mentioned a little bit ago, uh, because every round, you're doing Yahtzee stuff. You're rolling, set aside dice, re-roll, set aside dice, re-roll. And the dice you're rolling and re-rolling are to activate your group of adventurers. At its heart, though, this is an engine-building game where your group of adventures are the engine. 
You want to get adventurers that synergize well together, and if you can activate one with the dice you roll, that that can actually feed into the powers of the other guys so that you can get more and more powerful and defeat more and more bad guys and score more and more points, saving the town. It's uh, it's a really great escalation game. You start out, your group is maybe doing 5 points of damage around. By the end of the game, they're doing like 25 points of damage and taking out big super dragons and whatnot. Neat game. Fun, clever, fast-playing fantasy hordes and heroes. Then we've got Fields of Green, which is a very cool card drafting game from the same designer as Among the Stars. And it basically takes Among the Stars, which was a cool space station building game where you drafted cards like Seven Wonders, built up your space station, and it was a logistic puzzle trying to put all the different modules of the space station in the right position so they could like uh, you know fire off each other and give you lots of points. Now, that same basic idea has been brought into 50s um, Farmer. They are, we're basically, we're like Americana farmers in the 50s, 60s. And instead of building a space station, we're trying to build the best farm, raise crops instead of generate energy. It's um, And it took the same basic ideas of Among the Stars, which worked great. It was one of our favorite games, uh, card drafting games of all time. Just barely beats out by Seven Wonders. And it makes it deeper and tougher because it adds the... Um, the extra challenge of having to keep the farm running every round. In, in Among the Stars, basically, you did all your scoring right at the end of the game. And it was all just building towards that end-game scoring. Now, in this game, you have mid-game scoring as well. And if you cannot power those mid-game scoring things, your farm actually kind of falls behind. So you're under a lot of pressure. You can't just build for the end-game. You have to build for the early game and the mid-game as well. We like it so much, it is actually replaced Among the Stars for us. And so I'm looking forward to picking up a final copy because, I mean, it's it's a heavier version of Among the Stars with a different theme. That is Fields of Green. Then we've got Guilds of London. Oh, such a wonderful game. Easily one of the top ten best games of this year. Easily. But it is such a mean game. It is a multi-card use game of area control. Players using the cards they've got in their hands in lots of clever, combo-tastic ways to take control of all the various guilds of London and actually the colonies of London in the New World as well. Brilliant game. Just phenomenal design, but so mean. Every step of the way, you're trying to undercut your opponent. I mean, we couldn't keep it, but man, we love the gameplay. In Guilds of London. Then we've got Heir to the Pharaoh, a very neat two player only auction game where you are going to do what is, it? I forget, there's something like you're going to do 50 auctions over the course of the game. Every round you are auctioning to gain the favor of the different pantheon of gods in ancient Egypt uh, and using those to be able to build up the uh, tomb of the Pharaoh and uh, all the obelisks that you know adorn the the countryside around it. It's full of really clever gameplay, and it puts to rest, I hope forever, the notion that you can't have good two-player auctions because it's a phenomenal two-player game. The auctions are very, very clever. Only problem, once again, uh, for me and Jen, this is a game that's very, very in your face. It's very much, oh, I will succeed by ensuring you fail. And so it was just a little too in your face for me and Jen, but we thought it was a very clever game, Heir to the Pharaoh. Then we've got In the Name of Odin. Um... Which actually got mentioned a bit earlier um, in Jen's special guest appearance. So, what is it? It's a very simple. It's it's really kind of a gateway Viking simulation where you uh, have a handful of cards you can use in a couple different ways to recruit more Vikings you need to go on your Viking raids or to build up your little Viking village to get all the support you need to um, you know build the boats. You go on the Viking raids and repair the boats and get heroes to lead the raids. It's a it's a fun fast playing game. Really sharp. Great intro gateway game. And uh, I look forward to seeing more. I mean, I really hope to see some expansions that give it a little bit more depth. But we've definitely enjoyed our time with In the Name of Odin. Next up, we've got Jorvik. This is the only game on this list that I've not done a run-through for, but I have because Jorvik is a, another Viking game that is a retheme of Die Spiekerstadt, or Die Spikerstadt is pronounced, uh, which is a very clever but cutthroat auction game from designer Stefan Feld. It's been out of print forever, and Dekai Spiker has been even, its expansion has been even more out of print. People have been so desperate to get it. Spikerstadt and Kai Spiker. It's finally, both of them have now been combined into one game, given a graphic overhaul, give a thematic overhaul, but it's the exact same game. Nothing has changed about the gameplay. So if you want to know about Jorvik, go back and watch my Kai Spiker run through, and you have a pretty good idea. We thought it was clever, but maybe... 
the meanest auction game we've ever played. So it wasn't for me and Jen, but maybe it's right for you. That's Jorvik. Then we've got King Domino. Oh my gosh, this is another one that um, the run-through is coming. Or have I done this run-through yet? Oh man, in the ru mad rush to Essen, I'm losing track of what I filmed and what I haven't and what Paulo has actually done notes for. Um, you know, uh, but uh, um, if you haven't seen it yet, the run-through for this will be coming very soon. It's a neat little game of domino drafting. Uh, instead of card drafting or dice drafting, we're drafting dominoes, and the dominoes represent different landscapes. And we're trying to build our own neat little 5x5 five five kingdom. It's a kingdom built of dominoes. Get it? King Domino. And it's a fun little trifle of a game. Uh, it wasn't super heavy. It plays really well. The The drafting is very clever, works very nicely. But I think it's going to be a bit more exciting with more people drafting. For two... We enjoyed it, but if anything, it was maybe a little bit too easy because we were able to get too much of what we wanted and we were always able to succeed. Really wanted to have a little bit more challenge, and I think that would be better with more. But I still, I think a lot of people will really enjoy King Domino, even with two. Then we've got Kodama the Tree Spirits. This is a gorgeous game, an absolutely beautiful game of uh, building a tree for the Kodama Tree Spirits. Uh, you've got these cards that represent the branches, and you're playing them to your tree, and you're kind of doing the set collection thing because you're trying to make your branches play off getting the same kind of icon, like fireflies or special types of leaves, appearing over and over and over again on the same branch. So, so you don't want to mix up and suddenly have this type of leaf appear on your branch that was devoted to fireflies. Uh, and the more points you can score, the, uh, the better. But you're also building to get these Kodama Tree Spirits, which are like these secret objectives you have. So are you trying to build a tree that is good for this spirit? So you basically got all these different secret objectives trying to pursue. It's absolutely lovely. And by the time the game is over, you have built a little work of art on the table in front of you. These gorgeous, lovely-looking trees. And, I mean, just lovely, delightful game. Kodama, the tree spirits. Then we've got Mask of Anubis. Oh, this game is so clever, so neat. Uh, you take your smartphone, your iPhone or your Android, you put it into the Mask of Anubis, which is this little cardboard um, construction thing you build out, kind of like Google Cardboard, and one player is looking into the Mask of Anubis, basically looking at a three-dimensional recreation of the interior of an Egyptian tomb. Nobody else can see what the one player sees, and the one player is trying to describe what they see. Because what you do is you make several trips into the tomb, and you show up in random spots, and whenever a player's looking around, they have to describe to everybody else, here's what I see. I see a long corridor with a, with a path that goes off to the left. There's a, uh, there, there's a sarcophagus at the end of the corridor, and a, um, you know, a, and there's a mummy walking around and stuff like that. So all the other players are trying to recreate what you're describing, and it's a communication game. After you, you only have a minute to describe, and then you have to take the mask and us off, and hopefully they got it right. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, because everybody has to take turns using the mask and describe to everybody else, we're trying to get an accurate depiction of the layout of this tomb maze. And if we succeed, we win. If we fail, we lose. It's, it's a brilliant game. It is so shows off the reality of what app and board game integration can be. like no, There's no other way you could have created this experience. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit, but man, is it crazy stressful. Crazy stressful. Plus, with two players, I think it was a little bit too easy. You really want to have more players playing the game to increase the difficulty a bit. But either way, check out the run-through for it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, Mask of Anubis. And it's going to sell out fast. Mask of Anubis. Then we've got... Morocco, which is a neat little area control game all about a uh, players trying to set up stalls in a Moroccan trader's market. And um, it's, it's pretty cool, but really not that great as a two-player game. You want to have three or four players so that um, you know all the spaces are being grabbed by lots of players. It became a little bit too zero-sum in two-player, but we liked it. It was a very clever system you used for actually claiming land in this big land grab. Um, it was neat. It was solid, but not great for two. That's Morocco. Then we've got Mystic Veil, vale, which I already talked about when I was doing the expansions. Oh my gosh, what a brilliant game. A deck builder where instead of building your deck, you're building the cards that are inside your deck. Um, rare for me to say this, but it is literally a technological breakthrough, a wonderful gimmick. Uh, the only problem with the base game, it was just missing a little bit of the content. That's why I mentioned earlier, I'm so excited for its expansion to come out because now it will be a truly whole game. Uh, but still, you can check out my run-through to see what it's about. 
Mystic Veil. Then we've got Mythe. Oh, man, this is another one that you may not have seen the run through, but you'll be seeing it shortly. Charming, clever, little push your luck game. Um, the, maybe the coolest thing about the game is the components. The board itself is a pop-up board, just like pop-up books of your childhood. Why haven't more people done this? It's so brilliant. It's so clever. The game itself is neat, but like many push your luck games, it's really kind of a little, wrote as only a two-player game, you need to have more players on the race, everybody racing to get the Mystic Cheese um, and you know, and defeat the Dragon. With only two players, it, the Hopscotch wasn't quite as exciting. With more players, I could see it being a lot of fun. That's called Mythe, which is spelled funny. M-Y-T-H-E. It, it's like myth- it looks like Mythy, but it's Mythe because you're little hero mice trying to defeat the Dragon and get the cheese. Oh, man, folks. This is taking forever. I promise it'd be quick. Let's let's uh, pump out the jam. Uh, uh, pump up the jam. Oh, I can't even remember my night. I, I, I am back. Stay on target. Oceanos is a cool card drafting game where players have their own little steampunk submarines, and they are basically just going on an undersea holiday, trying to see all the pretty fish and the pretty coral they can see through card drafting. And the card drafting is um, equally focused on trying to build up your submarine in different ways, getting different special powers, and trying to do this kind of set collection of getting the right corals, getting the right fish, um, you know, and, and getting the right uh, energy so you can power up your sub. Really neat, fun, fast, and surprisingly tense. This seems like a really simple game, but we were surprised the depths of it. The hidden depths, one might say, of uh, Oceanos. Next up is Perdition's Mouth, which I believe is finally going to be coming out, folks. It's taken quite a while, but this is a brilliant... It looks like an Ameritrash-style dungeon crawl with really gorgeous minis, great components, big epic campaign story mode that you play through, but... What's interesting is the gameplay is all Euro. All the combat skirmish action is driven by rondelles. And um, it's it's really quite unlike anything else out there. There's a rondelle that the heroes use to, to initiate their actions. They're working cooperatively on the same rondelle. There's a separate rondelle that the enemies use to run their AI as they run around and try and beat us. And another cool thing, when you play through the entire campaign, this is something I hadn't seen before, but I think it's really brilliant. It reminds me a lot of the original film Die Hard, you know, where over the course of the movie, John McClane just gets beaten down. By the end of the movie, he can just barely limp across the finish line for the big final confrontation. That's the way this game works. You start out powerful, unbeatable as you work your way through this dungeon, but through the campaign, you suffer losses, you get beaten down. Uh, you know, the the horror. This is a uh, it's almost a survivor horror game, but a horror game, but it's set in a fantasy milieu. It just you know it becomes oppressive as you know your as your teammates die and your other ones get um, you know, constantly debilitated through a deck building mechanism. As I mentioned, there's also deck building in addition to the rondelles. It's a brilliant, innovative um, you know, it really turns all the conceits of of Ameritrash style dungeon crawl on their head, creates a really great storytelling. The only problem is it is very grim. It is a very dark, harrowing uh, adventure, and it was just a little bit too dark for Jen, because otherwise I think it would be something we would definitely seek out. But if you like that kind of like really grim horror fantasy setting, um, and you're looking for really clever, out-of-the-box, innovative gameplay, you might want to check out Perdition's Mouth. Moving on, we've got The Perfumer. Yet another game my run-through hasn't come for yet, but it'll be coming very shortly, I promise. This is an interesting game. It is super featherweight, light, pick-up-and-deliver. It is 100% a gateway-style game <clears throat> where players uh, take on the role of perfumers traveling around the world, gathering ingredients to make the best perfume. The Pick Up and Deliver is so-so. If you like Pick Up and Deliver, you'll probably like this. If, or I should say, very lightweight Pick Up and Deliver. The interesting thing about this game is, in addition to a Pick Up and Deliver, we are, there's also a component of the olfactory. We get these swatches, scratch and sift swatches, that we have as we travel the world, we are also trying to identify specific scents. And if we can, we can score a lot of bonus points. But there's this whole thing that even if your sense of smell is terrible, you can kind of piggyback off of the scent of other players and pay attention to what they're doing. And then if they're right, you can gamble that they'll be right and hope that you... Um, 
um, your estimates are wrong. But if you think they're wrong, you can go a different way. It's a clever game, way too light. Jen and I, we don't like pick up and deliver. And even still, I mean, this, I mean, this is lighter than Ticket to Ride. This is the lightest of lightweight games. But if you're looking for a super light gateway and you're interested in the idea of beautiful smelling gameplay on top of that, you might want to check out Perfumer. Next up is Rattle Battle Grab the Loot Angry Ocean, a lovely, charming little blister pack of expansion content for Rattle Battle Grab the Loot. I was a bit bummed to find it didn't really solve any of the, quote, problems. Not that Jen and I think there are problems. It won't make you like Rattle Battle Grab the Loot if you didn't. But if you did like Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, you got to get this expansion. It's great. Adds a lot of humor, lots of clever new features. Next up, Roll for the Galaxy Ambition. I'm surprised this is on the list, but I guess it's finally getting released in in Europe, in languages other than English. So that's worth mentioning. And Roll for the Galaxy is in Jen's top 10 favorite games of all time. Uh, Ambition is an amazing expansion. It's simply must-have. That's all there is to say. Uh, then Roundhouse. Ooh. Uh, this one, I'm running out of time. I have a... No, I'm going to get this done. This is another one. I have... Mm. I haven't played this one yet. Um, but the interesting thing about it to me is it is from the designers of Burano. And that was a very, very cool, clever, heavy Euro game that came out, was it last year? I think it was last year at Essen. And it reminded me a lot of a Steffen Feld style game. Those designers have now come back. This is their second big heavy Euro game. Will it remind me of a Steffen Feld game again? I don't know. I'm running out of time. I need to get my prototype played and filmed. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, The crux of it is, in case you haven't done the run-through by the time you listen to this, um, it's based on this... uh, Was it Chinese? uh, There's this one province of ancient China where... They uh, build these big, gigantic houses that are basically an entire village inside one big house. Like a big apartment complex, but it's a whole village. And they're round. And I don't know what the gameplay is like. But I didn't know about this historical feature of ancient China. I'm looking forward to learning more. I'm looking forward to seeing if the designers of Burano are one-trick ponies or if they've come up with another great, brilliant uh, gameplay design for Roundhouse. Watch my run-through coming soon. Shot and Totten is a remake of Battleline, or a retheming, a reimplementation of Battleline, which is a retheming of Shot and Totten. Neat little two player face off on the opposite side of a line trying to do area control, outplay your opponents. I've done the run through. Neat game, clever game. One of those games that Jen loves and I hate because it just makes me feel stupid. It's so clever from designer Reiner Knizia. Uh, it's back for the first time ever with a really brilliant, lovely production that it totally deserves. Shot and Totten. Squirrel Rush is a neat little family friendly gateway game. It was too light for me and Jen, but so clever. If we had kids, it would be a total keeper as cute little squirrels run around trying to collect nuts for winter in a constantly changing, evolving board. Neat, clever gameplay. Great for families. Squirrel Lush. That's it, folks. I'm speeding up now. I'm in the home stretch. Next up, The Networks. Wonderful game. Uh, We did the run-through of the prototype last year. If it hasn't changed much, this might make it into our top 10 games of the year if we end up getting a copy of it. I really hope to because I want to see that expansion as well that I already talked about earlier. What is it? We're running our own TV network, trying to put the right shows on in the right time um, slots with the right directors and right actors and right writers and right ads to score the right amount of points. Brilliant game. Absolutely love it to death, the networks. Tramways, a very neat Fresh, original deck builder where um, we are building a deck to be able to build a network of of trams in a city. Oh, there is so much clever, original gameplay that went into this. It's very unique, very fresh. I really can't do it justice in a quick summary. Go check out my run-through, but it's absolutely... It's just the bee's knees. Such a smart design, tramways. Also, we have Vinos Deluxe Edition, which is an excellent updated edition to Vinos. Um, I know not everybody's really excited about it because they maybe don't necessarily like the new graphic design and layout, uh, but Jen and I, we think it's totally fine, and we certainly like all the new gameplay options that are available. So uh, check out my original run-through or the updated run-through so you can see what the differences are, and if you might want to seek this out. Spoiler alert, it's excellent. It always has been. It's one of Vita Lasarda's finest games ever. Almost there, folks. Two more. 
Virus. This is a real-time cooperative dungeon crawl. It's set after a virus zombie apocalypse has all but wiped out humanity. We are on a mission. We've been sent to the military compound where the original zombie virus was developed. we got to get in there and find the cure. But of course, there's zombies chasing us. Standard stuff. Here's what's unique about this. Uh, we trace, we race through the dungeon, which is this underground military fortress, in real time, with the zombies chasing us in real time. That's very, very cool. But you've seen that maybe in stuff like, uh, you know, Escape Curse of the Temple and Escape Zombie City. What's interesting about this game is, oh man, oh I can't. I, uh, that, well, okay, there's a lot that's interesting about it, but. In games like Escape Zombie City or, or what have you, you're really at the uh, at the whim of luck. The tiles you draw as you're um, you know just trying to explore around. In this game, luck goes away entirely. You know exactly. You you don't. It's not random luck what you draw. You know the exact pieces of the dungeon you've got, and players are in real time strategically trying to come up with the smartest d dungeon design as possible so that they can outwit the zombies, set traps for them, stay one step ahead from it as they continually spawn and put more and more pressure. Man, ugh, I'm really not doing it justice. It's an incredibly brilliant, fresh, original design, unlike anything else out there. I've made it sound kind of like a repeat, but it's really not. And the interesting thing is, at the time I did the run-through, it was a real-time-only game on Kickstarter. And in all honesty, that was a real problem for Jen. She found that it was just too, too much pressure. The developer heard the feedback from folks who wanted to play the game because they were really enamored of all the clever, fresh gameplay mechanisms, but weren't excited about real-time. He went back to the drawing board. He came up with rules now that allow you to play it turn-based. I cannot wait to try it as a turn-based game. I believe that will solve all of Jen's problems, and it becomes a, a you know, a, it, it becomes the best of both worlds, a game that works well for turn-based fans and a, one that works well for real-time fans. Either way, like Perdition's Mouth which I mentioned earlier, a very fresh, clever take. Just full, I mean, this game has so many gameplay mechanisms I've never seen before. It's got like five games worth of gameplay mechanisms all in one game. Really smart virus. And the last one on the list, folks, is why, because we're at the end of the list, there's no Zs, why for Yokohama, which is a very neat, um, economic Euro resource gathering converting into points style game. The crux of what makes it special is it's kind of like the reverse Istanbul. I talked about Istanbul a bit um, earlier. If you've ever played Istanbul, that's a game where um, as you travel around the board, your character moves around the board to get items to, to basically score points, and he leaves behind a trail. In this game, you build the trail first before you start moving around the board. It's kind of, I guess, uh, I never thought about it. It's, it's a route building game where you are sending your assistants to all the different spots in Yokohama so that when you, the manager, eventually get to those spots, you'll be able to have big, powerful turns and collect a lot of stuff. But um, this is a very tight board, and there are other people moving around, and as other people move around, they become blockers for you. And you thought, well, I've spent all my time getting my assistants to the right spot, but I can't go there now because it's blocked off for me. What do I do instead? Do I go somewhere else? It's a very clever game. From the designer of Trains um, and got picked up by Tasty Minstrel Games, so it's getting a big deluxe. Although I don't know if the version that's um, going to appear at Essence is the deluxe version or not. If it is, that's going to be in very limited supply and it'll never be available again. So seek that out. The same way the deluxe version of Orléans had incredibly limited supply and can never be gotten again. Whether it's deluxe or regular, though, doesn't matter. It's brilliant gameplay, a lot of fun. Jen, I enjoyed it a lot. That is Yokohama. Wow, folks. What happened to the, oh, I'll just say a sentence or two each time? That took a bit longer than I thought. Not surprising, really. But, oh, the light's at the end of the tunnel. One more to go. Next up is the games that you cannot buy, but you can certainly demo. I'll tell you which ones I'm excited about and why right after this. All right, everybody, demo time. This has got to go quicker. Oh, man. Let's see if we can get through this. What do we got here? We've got 16 games that cannot be bought at the show, but you can still sit down with the developers and play them. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. 
This is probably my favorite thing to do at a convention is get an early look at games, you know, get to talk to the developers of them, you know, get an understanding for what goes into them and um and heck, maybe even have an impact on them by giving feedback right at the at the time. Um never mind the fact that of course you get to see games long before they're ever going to come out, so you can decide whether you want to be excited about it. So, these are the 16 games that jumped out at me while reading Eric Martin's list as worthy of checking out. So, where did, oh, and I just had the list up a second ago. And oh goodness gracious, I'm I'm really starting to lose it, folks. I, I got to tell you. All right, all right, all right. There, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> and oh, and these are loosely, vaguely ordered in representing my interest level, um, like like the first list was. So too is this list. So let's start out with guilds. That's the uh, plural guilds. Why is it on my list? I don't know. I don't know anything about this game. Uh, I really don't want to go off again on a rant about why aren't publishers doing more to get me excited about their games. Um, at least this one has actually released some screenshots of their card art. It looks quite nice. Unfortunately, all the text on the cards is in Italian, so I can't tell what they do. All I know is, oh, we're building up our guilds to recruit fantasy characters into our guilds for reasons, for points, probably. Uh, I know it looks good. It could be good. I really don't know. But I know one way to find out. Check out a demo for guilds. Uh, next up, Sword and Sorcery. And actually, this one I have played before. This is one of three or four on this list that I've played. So that's why, that's really the only reason it's a bit lower on my list. If I'd never played it, it would probably be much, much higher. Um, but uh, it's Sword and Sorcery, which is a very solid Ameritrash-style dice-chucking co-op fantasy campaign-based adventure. When I did a run-through for it uh, last year, I really did like it quite a bit. I have to admit, since then, for me, the shine has gone off a little bit, only because I've been uh, exposed to games like Gloomhaven. And, uh, oh, what, did I, what was the other one? Um, I just talked about it a little in the last section. Why can't I remember the name now? Oh, because I've just completely lost the plot. Perdition's Mouth! Perdition's Mouth and Gloomhaven, which are both brilliantly designed big, rollicking campaign fantasy cooperative adventures, but those ones have Euro game driven mechanisms. This one is much more unabashedly Ameritrash. It is all about chucking dice, and more dice, and more dice, and more dice. Specialty dice for attacking, and enemies, and all of that stuff. Now, don't get me wrong, it does it really, really well, and Jen and I did enjoy it, and I think what I enjoyed the most about it was the fact that it takes a lot of its gameplay mecha- or structure from RPG video games like EverQuest or World of Warcraft. I thought that was actually really cool, and it did cr- may give it a different feel than your Descents and your Mice and Mystics and all the other ones out there. So I definitely still say it's worth checking out. That what is that again? Sword and Sorcery. Uh, after that, we've got Dungeon Hero Manager. This is another one where once again there's literally no information available about the gameplay. So why did I list it? I have to admit, I'm intrigued by the topic, which it, it's, it basically seems, well, I'm a hero manager. I'm not the hero. I'm somebody, I'm a smart enough businessman to hire a bunch of rubes to have them go plunder the dungeon and bring me back the treasure. And I don't care if they die. Uh, from the from the thematic description of it, it almost sounds like, well, and from the title itself, uh, this is a game where, yeah, um, you know, the life of a hero is cheap. And it's more about me making strategic choices about when to sacrifice this guy so the other one can live so I can get the treasure out. Maybe? I don't really know. I, I, I gotta admit, I just like the title. Dungeon Hero Manager. That kind of grabbed my attention. So, um, it might be higher if they would have told me something about the gameplay, but I'm still intrigued. After that, actually this entry uh, stands in for uh, several different games that you'd be able to check out early pre-release versions of at the Ludi Creations booth. I actually chose Ayunu, or you know, I U N U, which sounds like it's been a uh, print, a popular print and play game for quite a while, and so they picked it up for full on development and production. And the game itself, it's a card game where, as you know, ancient Egyptian leaders, we are focusing equally on trying to provide 
for our people to improve their life both in this world and the next. We are playing these cards to you know improve their mortal lives and their 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 eternal lives uh, you know after they move on. I don't know how it works, but I have to admit I'm very intrigued by that. That sounds really cool. But really, the main thing is pretty much everything Looted Creations done is always interesting and offbeat and quirky. So, I mean, if you're over there for a new new, check out Long Live the Queen or uh, Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden. Or um, They Who Were Eight. Uh, or no, no, They Who Were Eight you could actually buy. But, you know, I mean, Ludicrations has a few different games. All of them sound very, very quirky, either because of the gameplay or because of the setting or both. Um, but, you know, you're always going to be surprised by what you get over at Ludicration. So I, w- I could actually just change this entry to Ludicrations. They've got a few different games that are worth checking out, but I'm most interested in Ayunu. Okay, and then after that, we've got Minds of Olnak. Oh, I'm just going to be so shallow. I mean, I I heard about this game months ago. And when I put it on my 2016 Games of Interest, I was pretty open and honest. I said, you know, I don't know anything about this game. The publishers haven't really released rule books. They haven't given a good, decent explanation of how the game works. The turn structure, nothing. But it looks so pretty. It's so pretty. The art is so pretty. I am so shallow. I want to check it out. And you know what? It's been months and nothing's changed. There's still not very hardly any information at all. I guess it's a worker placement area control in a dwarven dungeon called the Mines of Olnak. That's that's all I can tell you. But again, it's so pretty. Maybe I'll get to find out what this game is about by actually doing a demo of it. The Mines of Olnak. Uh, next up now, this sounds really cool. I'm really kind of excited about this one. Perfect Crime. This is a bank heist game, but it's asymmetrical because... On the one side, you've got the player or players working cooperatively who are planning their heist. You're going to break in, crack the vault, get out while avoiding all the sentries, all the guards and what, and, you know, the security apparatus, the, the, the remote monitors, all that stuff. That's what, um, some players are doing, but one player owns the bank and is the one responsible for setting up all the defenses and running the defenses and trying to keep the thieves out. That's so cool. What an awesome, cool, asymmetrical idea for a game. I'm really excited about this. I hope it lives up to its promise, because what a great idea. One player is building the maze, the map that the other players are going to explore, setting up the traps, etc., etc. Should be really cool. Perfect crime. And after that, we've got Save the President, Save the World. Again, maybe this one should be up a little bit higher, because once again, no idea what the gameplay is about. What is with these publishers? Whatevs, I put it here at this level, I'll be honest, because it really seems like this game is going to have a big focus on humor. Um, Because in this game, it's a cooperative game, where um, the White House is under attack, and I I think by by monsters or aliens or something like that, and all the, the Secret Service... They've been taken out. They're done. The president is doomed. Who who can step up to save the president? Tourists. People who just happen to be touring the White House. And that's who we are as players. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means we have special tourism powers we have to use. Maybe that means we're really weak. Whatever it is, it's a cooperative game where civilians are trying to save the president from alien invasion. That's charming. I got to check that out, right? Save the president. Save the world. After that, we've got Museum. Now, this is a game. This is a Euro-style simulation of running a museum, trying to um, you know, get the right artifacts uh, to attract the right people to come and visit so you can you know, and, and lay out your museum correctly. This has been on my games of interest list for years, it seems like. Uh, finally, at Essen this year, we'll finally get a chance to play it. And I've always been interested from what I have read of the gameplay, which sounds really solid, but I'm more interested than ever because now the artist assigned to it is Vincent Dutra, and from the art I've seen so far, this looks like it will be his most beautiful game to date. And if you haven't seen Vincent Dutra's art, Vincent Dutra, Vincent Dutra, no, I'm sorry, I still don't know how to pronounce his name. Heck, we have to go in to see it to find out how to pronounce the man's name would be worth it. But it looks stunningly gorgeous. So... Uh, at, at this point, I mean, it looks so good, it's almost a must-buy. And I just want to see, does the gameplay, which I've been waiting for for years, live up? So that's Museum. Simple name, just Museum. After that, we've got Nemesis. 
And I've got to admit, I mean, I, this is probably a non-starter because it's a cooperative sci-fi survival horror adventure game. Everybody's working, trying to get away from the scary, terrifying aliens that are attacking the ship. We've all woken up from our deep space slumber thing, and uh, maybe one of us is a traitor, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. The thing, I mean, I like that kind of stuff, but I suspect Jen won't. But I live in hope that maybe, since she won't play uh, Space a Hulk Death Angel with me, that maybe I can find a game that she'll play with me. Maybe Nemesis is the one. Probably not. But hope springs eternal. After that, this one. Okay, there's one reason this one's on my list. Kung Fu Panda the board game. And it's not Poe and all the rest of the wacky characters from Kung Fu Panda. I mean, Kung Fu Panda is nice. We enjoy Kung Fu Panda. It's 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 cute. It's it's charming. It's not the best, but it, it's it's cool. It's mostly harmless. What makes me interested in this? Cooperative Yahtzee. I don't know how that works. I want to experience that. Could be cool. I'm sure it'll look great. I'm sure it'll look absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but I am interested in a cooperative Yahtzee game. That sounds really neat to me. Uh, next up, we've got two tiny epics. Tiny Epic Galaxies Beyond the Black. I've already done a video for that. You can check it out. Um, the video, but... Why bother with that when you can actually go play the thing at the show? Uh, unfortunately, it won't be there to buy, but you can actually play it. But probably the main reason you would want to head over there is to check out the other thing you can play, Tiny Epic Quest. What is Tiny Epic Quest, you might ask? As near as I can tell, you might as well call it Tiny Epic Legend of Zelda. It is a fantasy adventure game. A big focus on the gameplay is travel. Do you travel by horse? Do you travel by flying creature? Do you travel by ship? As you are trying to move around in this little tiny epic fantasy kingdom, trying to complete quests um, and, and do various things, but always with an eye towards how do we travel? What is the best, most efficient way to move around in this world? Because the different modes of travel have very different styles. Uh, if you travel by ship, you have to move around the edge of the world. If you travel by dragon, you have to fly in a straight line. I, 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 or maybe that's horse. I don't really remember exactly, but it seems like it'll be a very, very charming, evocative game with a lot of Zelda vibes, but with also a very clever um, core gameplay mechanism um, that'll make it stand out from the rest. So uh, we're getting into the ones I really want to play, and Tiny Epic Quest is really high on the list. Uh, next up is Gloria, A Game of Nights. Another one that I have absolutely no idea what it's about gameplay-wise, but I'm interested because of the theme. This is basically, apparently, a Euro-style game, includes rondels and other stuff, that works hard to try to accurately capture the day-to-day -day life of being a medieval knight and living a chivalrous life. That right there is interesting. That it is not just, you know, kind of our, you know, Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur ideals of what a knight is, but the reality. And um, the other th reason I'm interested in this is the designers are actually medieval um, reenactors. So these are people who study this. And so... I, I think that only adds to the potential of this game to be really interesting because it's not a flight of fancy. It's serious. It, um, you know, it could be historically, uh, eludicating. So I'm very interested in Glory, a game of nights. After that, we've got Rising Five, which you will see my run through of before, uh, Essen comes along because at Essen, it's just going to be there. It, it's the Kickstarter will be live at that point. I've already done the run through. I'm just waiting for the Kickstarter to start so I can put my run through up. This is awesome. Jen, I really enjoyed this game a lot. It is a cooperative worker placement game that is app-driven and um, features the art of Vincent Dutrois. Again, once again, that guy shows up. It looks gorgeous. Cooperative worker placement app um, that is essential. Actually, that's not true. Like Alchemist, you could play it without an app. If, you, if, if one player wants to sit around and be the encyclopedia who looks stuff up, because they don't get to play the game. Um, the app basically just takes over the dirty work, because at its heart, this is a deductive game. As we travel around and race against time to save this kind of fantasy science fiction planet from destruction um, by finding ancient runes and figuring out where to place them. What is the core gameplay mechanism that holds all this together? Mastermind. If you remember Mastermind, I mean, I grew up playing it in the 70s. It is a core deduction game. And the thing is... 
I remember playing it with my brother, and it was always kind of annoying because, well, one of us actually got to play the game, and the other person was the mastermind who had the most boring job in the world of just looking to see how many things you got right and how many you got wrong and giving out clues. There was no game at all. So how perfect. Let an app do that. And players can all work together to save the world. It's a solid, clever, fun, fast-playing game. Jen and I definitely enjoyed it. And um, you can check it out at Essen. Give it a play. Rising 5. After that, we've got Edge of Humanity. I'm interested in this one. This is a deck builder that promises to have some very cool, innovative, new ideas. It doesn't say what they are. So once again, I find that very frustrating. Here's the reason I'm interested, though. Earlier, I talked about how I'll probably be disappointed that Nemesis will not be the game that works because Jen will hate that. Um, what do you call it? That uh, subject matter of survivor horror, survival horror in space. Jen loves post-apocalypse fiction when it's not zombies, when it's not Mad Max, when it's real. When it's, you know, uh, speculative fiction, you know, whether it's peak oil or, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, running out of water, you know, I mean, the, the type of post apocalypse that we could actually imagine really happening that, you know, all the preppers out there prep for. And I'll be honest, Jen has a little bit of a streak of prepper in her. Um, this is, Edge of Humanity is a game where a real apocalypse has happened. And it doesn't, actually, the description doesn't even say what it is, just that mankind is trying to rebuild from this unrecoverable state. That's what attracts me, because I suspect, well, um, that I suspect this will be a very, very cool game that captures Jen's imagination. It promises cool, interesting, innovative takes on deck builders. We love deck builders. It's one of our favorite gameplay mechanisms, or not really a mechanism, more of a style of game or a structure of game. And uh, I just can't wait to find out. It's my second most interesting uh, because I, I've been waiting. I mean, we keep getting all these post-apocalypse games, but they're silly comic books, science fiction post-apocalypse. I want real, meaningful, human post-apocalypse. So Edge of Humanity is very, very enticing for that reason. And the number one, and I'll be honest, I've played this game, but I, I've, I've just been waiting and waiting and waiting. I want to play it some more. I already mentioned it a little bit ago. What is it? Gloomhaven. Heartbreaking the Gloomhaven will not be ready to actually buy, but it will be there. Folks can play it. I just look forward. I mean, I haven't played it for over a year, and when I played it before, there were already so many cool things in place. I want to see it. I want to go over there and check out, does it deliver? Um, because when I did my run-through, the core gameplay was great. That was a given. But a lot of the stuff about the legacy fantasy campaign, because that's what I love about this more than anything else. It's the next legacy game that Jen and I will be able to play. We can't play Risk Legacy. We can't play, oh, what's the other one called? Seafall. Uh, because we don't have three players and we don't want to attack each other. We love Pandemic Legacy. Pandemic Legacy 2 isn't going to be out for a while. What do we have in the meantime? Gloomhaven. A big, epic, fantasy adventure cooperative game with brilliant Euro-style game mechanisms instead of Ameritrash dice rolling and epic legacy storytelling where the choices we make permanently change the world with stickers and all the rest of it. And uh, when I did the run-through, the gameplay was solid. I didn't get to see a lot of the campaign. I want to go over there. I want to find out, does the campaign deliver on everything I hoped for? Gloomhaven. Um, that's it, folks. Those would be um, the 16 games I would seek out for demo purposes. And... I can't tell you how sore my throat is now. I've gone through like six or seven Ricola in this talk through so far. And I'm wondering, should I, do I have the strength to go back and tally a list of promos? There's a real, oh, uh, I don't know. I need to take a break. Hold on a second. We'll find out um, whether I wrap it up or whether I give you a promo rundown as well. Be right back. <music> Okay, folks, we've come this far. Let's finish it off right. Let's talk about the must-has promos of Essence Field 2016. Although, really, I don't know why you'd be interested in my personal list, because it's so easy for anybody to make their own. There's actually a really nice geek list on Board Game Geek. You can find the link for it in the show notes of this podcast. Uh, this year, it's being maintained by Louise McCauley. Louise, thank you very much for making this so much easier. And uh, I'm just going to list in alphabetical order the ones that jumped out at me. 
that I will probably see what I can do to get my hands on, starting with the Anachrony 10-card promo pack. Uh, apparently, it's going to be available for picking up Anachrony. Well, you want those promos as well, right? There's several Ave Roma packs available, and they actually sound like they changed the game up in pretty significant ways. So those are well worth seeking out. Of course, the biggest one, the, the big boy on the block, is the Brett Spiel Advents Calendar 2016. You may recall last year I picked one up, and then every day, for the first 24 days of December, Jen and I ran through that together all over Malta. Now, I'm not promising we're going to do anything like that again. I don't even know if I'm going to pick up the Brett Spiel Advent Calendar for 2016 because I haven't actually looked at what's in it, but... There's going to be a lot of good promos in there, so that's something to consider. Then you've got um, some picture promo tiles for Codenames Pictures. You've got a, a promo pack for Colony, which I definitely want to pick up because my review copy of Colony does not have any promo cards, so i got to get the full set. Uh, Dale of Merchants 2, when you pick that up, you'd also want to pick up the promo, the uh, Systemic Eurasian Beavers, of course, because why wouldn't one? Then, oh, oh and this is interesting. In addition to the Brett Spiel Advents calendar, uh, the same guy who's done that the last year and this year is also doing the Deutscher Spiel Preise 2016 goodie box, which is another box. Uh, and that's really interesting. Oh, I also forgot to mention the Advent calendar last year was a problem for a lot of people because it was this big, gigantic box that was very, very hard for people to take back home on the plane. This year, I forgot to mention, he is still producing the big, gigantic box if you want the full experience, but he's also producing a small, easily portable, easily take backable, homeable box also. I assume the same thing is true for his Deutsche Spiel Preise 2016 goodie box also. There's a new Dominion card called Sauna, Fields of Green, the Crop Circle, um, Goons of New York, which is for New York 1901. I'm really interested in that because ultimately after Jan and I played New York 1901 some more, we still liked it, but it's just so light. We just couldn't justify keeping it around. But Goons of New York actually sounds like it adds some very interesting special powers. So I'm learn, interested to learn more about that. Then you've got Guilds of London, Essen Guilds Pro. Well, actually, what am I kidding? I'm not going to get Guilds of London. It's too mean. But if I would, I would certainly want that. Oh, but, oh, this is interesting. Inhabit the Earth, which I did a run-through for from last year, it actually comes with these little cardboard tile racks. You can hold all your tiles and keep them secret. But there was a printing error with the base game last year where the tile racks worked, but they were facing the wrong way, so you weren't actually, the art wasn't presented correctly. Well, they've gone back and fixed that, so people who picked up Inhabit the Earth last year can now pick up proper tile racks. I'll definitely be getting those, because we've kept Inhabit the Earth. It's a neat game. Uh, key Flower, uh, uh, Key Meliquin, whatever that is, always got to get all the Key Flower. Kodama Playable Goodies, whatever that is. Kodama is gorgeous, so I'm sure those will be gorgeous too. Uh, see, I talked earlier about Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Apparently, you can get some leader promo cards. And, oh, for Mysterium, in addition to getting the, uh, the expansion, there's a promo for a Meeple Murder Weapon. Of course, uh, how are they killed? Uh, is Professor Plum with the Meeple. Let's uh, see. Then, uh, Quadropolis is doing a Ludofact pro promo. That's interesting. I guess Quadropolis has done promos for like every board game, friendly local game store in the world, it seems like. There's all these promos out there. I don't think they actually changed the fundamental gameplay. They're just reskins using the basic stuff. But hey, this might be my chance to finally get one of those things. Rattle Battle Grab the Loot has a, another little mini promo expansion called Port Scuffle that sounds very interesting for when you go back to port. And for those like me who got the version that has cardboard money instead of metal money, they're selling the metal coins. I don't know. I'm actually really happy with that, with that cardboard money. Come to think of it, it's really thick. But we'll, we'll see. I'll take a look at them. Uh, Robinson Crusoe is getting a whole new scenario having to do with poachers. That's a pretty big deal. And there are some promo cards and tiles for Roundhouse, which I mentioned earlier. Still haven't done that run through. Got to get to that. Uh, oh, and it's interesting. I mean, I already talked about Russian railroads, American railroads as a full on expansion. But yeah, you know what? I, I think Louise is right. Strictly speaking, it is a promo. It's just this one uh, punch out board. So it's probably worth mentioning here. And uh, this, let's see, what else do I got? Oh, Snowdonia season promo. And I wrote down Singe game card. Why did I write that down? I've totally forgotten what that was. But, again, you can find it on the Geek List. Uh, Terraforming Mars launch kit promo if I break down and get that game, which is a big if at this point. I really don't know. We'll see what the voters say. Then I want to get that promo. And finally, the Vinos Deluxe Edition. There's a few different promo packs. Got to get them all as that game just gets better the more stuff you throw into it. 
Phew. Okay, folks, that's it. I am tired. I have a splitting headache. My throat is on fire. It is ice cream o'clock. And then I think we're going to watch some Star Trek or something. Thanks. If you made it this far, you're a trooper. I don't know. Maybe it's you were listening to this on the plane ride to the show because who else could sit still for this long to listen to me yammer? But um, for anybody who's going to be at the show, I uh, look forward to saying hi. Again, as we mentioned earlier, you can swing by Hall 1G124 to say hi to Jen, take a look at her stuff, get a Rotto Runs Through sticker, um, and uh, oh, what else? Uh, get some cool raw or you know some cool gamer glass and as enter all the drawing oh and enter the drawing yes of course the enter the, how could I forget the entering of the drawing I'm kind of beat let's wrap that up for another rotto goof I can't get anything right folks okay thanks for listening questions comments concerns as always please let me know and be sure to send questions to questions at rotto.com and we'll be back to Q and A's next month along with return of normal programming and all the rest of it so talk to you everybody so long bye bye